Uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to today's symposium. To begin with, uh, requesting the IT team to play the Nalanda video. Nalanda. In February 2006, the former Indian President Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam mooted the idea of revival of the ancient seat of learning, the Nalanda University. Since then, a partnership of Asian countries, apart from India, especially Singapore, China, Japan, and South Korea have played active roles in reviving the Nalanda University. Revival of Nalanda University under the aegis of Ministry of External Affairs was driven by the broader vision of establishing greater integration with the East Asian community. The vision which forms a key component of India's Look East policy has been articulated by the Ministry. The new Nalanda University campus is a 455-acre green sustainable campus situated in a predominantly agricultural area in the 2.5-kilometer outskirts of the Rajgi town. The land was gifted to the university by the Bihar government under leadership of Sri Nitish Kumar Ji, Honorable Chief Minister, Bihar. The campus comprises of over 200 buildings and structures having built up area of over 20 lakh square feet including development of 300 acres of landscape and horticulture works, construction of 12.5 km internal road network, creation of around 100 acres of water bodies, including all modern services, utilities, interior and furnishing of the buildings. The Nalanda University campus is probably the world's largest net-zero sustainable green campus. The key sustainability features for developing this net-zero campus include net-zero energy, net-zero water, net-zero waste and net-zero emission. This hybrid concept featuring renewable energy sources with the indigenous approach and its integration with various innovative technologies shall undoubtedly exemplify rational approaches to construction of other upcoming projects, campuses and community construction models in future. The campus combines state-of-the-art technologies with planning principles of the ancient Nalanda University to create a carbon-neutral and zero-waste campus. Some of the most important and indigenous aspects and palette of concepts for passive methods operating at different scales are 6.5 MW solar PV captive power plant, 1.2 MW biogas plant, desiccant evaporative technology for cooling, heating of the buildings, solar integrated thermal storage technology for HVAC system, use of compressed stabilized earth blocks instead of common burnt clay bricks, thick cavity walls to increase thermal resistance, climate appropriate landscape design to reduce portable water demand, decentralized water treatment systems, cooling as well as cleaning of the air through use of selected native plants, building management system, etc. The main entry gate symbolizes the university as the temple of knowledge acquisition and a seat of higher learning. The first gate along the main road is the first threshold, marking the entry to the campus. The next grand entry gate, 7.5 meters wide, forms the neck, screening people and vehicles in. The large, curved volume creates a sense of pause and calm as felt in the temple entrances. The academic spine is spanning in the north-south direction of the campus. It houses around 40 various capacity classrooms with a total capacity of 1890 students varying from 25 to 300 seater classrooms, an examination center, international relations office, placement cell, meeting or discussion rooms of various sizes and other common facilities like faculty offices, laboratories, 100-seater mini auditorium, etc. In the southern side of the spine the Grand Sushma Swaraj Auditorium is situated followed by two guest houses namely, Campus Inn and International Center. The academic spine is grand welcomed by a huge semicircular catenary. The Grand Amphitheater, with a capacity of around 2,000 spectators, is situated amidst the center of the Kamal Sagar, the central water body. The amphitheater has a green room and a dais at its center. The structure is surrounded by the huge water body, which gives the audience sitting in the amphitheater an extravagant picturesque view featuring the lake in the backdrop. The amphitheater is surrounded by another circular 11 amenity modules, as seen in the aerial view. 
for informal discussions, small gatherings, chilling out space, etc. The administrative building is the backbone of the governance structure. This building with two wings is situated in the eastern part of the campus. The university administration comprising of the vice chancellor's secretariat, the administration and the finance are housed in these two wings. In the northern side of the building, the huge 30 feet by 20 feet Indian tricolor mounted on a 108 feet tall flag mast multiplies the magnanimity and pride of the campus. The ahas and pines as a part of the net zero sustainable campus water management system adds to the exquisiteness of the aesthetics of the building. Like the rest of the campus, this building is also environment resilient and reduces carbon footprint, be it in the form of usage of construction material methodology adopted or the strategic energy including water consumption techniques the nalanda central library building is envisioned to provide state-of-the-art facilities for study and multidimensional development of intellect and a locus for collaboration the building has a built-up area of 17,545 square meters with more than 3 lakh books volume and over 3,000 user capacity the huge Nalanda Library building is being built in ground plus five floors. The building is shaped as a spherical stupa divided in four quadrants with an outer radius of 81 meters at base and height of the building at crown is 26 meters, which makes it probably the biggest dome in the world. The works for construction of this building is in full swing. In order to fast track the progress, Precast construction methodology has been adopted wherein the structural member pieces of RCC pre-stressed columns, beams, walls and slabs are cast in the casting yard, transported at the site and erected sequentially floor by floor. Over 75% of the civil works for the building is completed and the building is likely to be handed over by end of this financial year. The Nalanda Yoga Come Meditation Center is being built right at the opposite to the central library building. Built in ground plus one floor, the circular building has a built-up area of 4,186 square meters. The ground floor is a 500-capacity multipurpose hall, and the first floor is the yoga hall with 266 yoga mat capacity along with ancillary facilities like green rooms, clock rooms with lockers and toilet banks in adequate numbers in both the floors. For the VIP visitors, a VIP lounge facility is also there which is connected with the yoga hall through a sky bridge. Roof of the building is spherical dome shape. The yoga center building design symbolize the seven meditation chakras and entire planning of the base of the building including the surrounding landscape is based on Muladhara Chakra. Roof of the building resembles the Sasarara Chakra. The VIP block has been designed and integrated with main yoga block to give a holistic retreat experience. Works of this building is also being carried out in precast system. Erection of both the floors of the building has been completed and overall physical progress of the building is over 80%. today for this symposium on heritage, architecture and culture. We look forward to what promises to be an engaging set of lectures and discussions led by a distinguished panel. We are much pleased to have them with us. We welcome them warmly and extend our thanks for joining hands with Nalanda University for this academic program. Without further delay, I would like to in invite uh, the following to the dais in the order, starting with Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Abhay Kumar Singh, <laughs> Mr. Ratish Nanda, CEO Aga Khan Trust for Culture India, <laughs> Dr. Gautami Bhattacharya, Superintendent Archaeologist, ASI Patna Circle, <laughs> Mr. Sajjad Shahid, Co Convener, Intac Hyderabad, <laughs> Mr. Umang Kochar, Research Assistant with the AKTC at Hyderabad. 
We are also pleased to have with us in the audience Ms. Archana Saad Akhtar, Program Director of Design and Outreach, AKTC India, and Bore Di Ganga Devi, Assistant Director at the State Museum's Department of Heritage, Telangana. Ganga Devi heads the curatorial responsibilities of the 14 galleries at the State Museum. A very warm welcome to all of you. Today's symposium is an outcome of a collaboration between two globally renowned institutions, Nalanda University and the Aga Khan Trust for Culture. At the ground level, this collaboration has been executed through the School of Historical Studies. We are grateful for the unwavering support of our Vice Chancellor, Professor Abhay Kumar Singh, who is also the Dean of Historical Studies. I personally benefited from his relentless encouragement at all stages of planning and preparation. I am also indebted to my dear colleagues for all of their help and support at various points of time. As India's ancient seat of learning, Nalanda stood for intellectual prowess and a glorious knowledge tradition. As the first residential university of the world, Nalanda tirelessly contributed to the mandate of academic excellence for eight long centuries, a remarkable feat that has placed our civilization on the golden pedestal of being called a Vishwaguru. It flourished in an intellectual and spiritual landscape where Lord Buddha, Lord Mahavira lived, and the scholastic traditions of Nagarjuna, Aryabhatta, and Dharmakirti thrived. As the successor of this legacy, 21st century Nalanda is committed towards reviving and preserving this intellectual heritage, which lies at the core for the all-round development of students coming from more than 30 countries. Supported by the Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India, the university upholds the message of harmony through I quote, man living in harmony with man, man living in harmony with nature, and man living as part of nature, unquote. Our collaborators for today's symposium, the Aga Khan Trust for Culture, is invested in promoting cultural heritage, reviving the built environment, thereby connecting us to the critical importance of historical memory. The multifarious activities of this organization, housed under the renowned Aga Khan Development Network, are spread across community development programs, nurturing cultural spaces, and connecting cultures through material and intangible arts like music and musical education. The aim has been to create awareness by connecting diverse cultures that contribute to societal development across the world. With this mandate, the AKTC is currently engaged in the restoration and preservation of the 16th century Qutub Shahi tomb complex and other heritage structures in and around Golconda and Hyderabad in the Deccan. Standing today in the 21st century, the region of the Deccan is home to almost a dozen UNESCO World Heritage Sites that easily testifies to its immense architectural and aesthetic legacy across a range of edifices, religious, courtly, residential, funerary, and defense. At a lot more awaits discovery, and those accessible demand preservation and careful restoration from time to time. This is precisely the sort of task the AKTC is engaged in for many years now, involving numerous heritage structures across the region of South Asia. To place today's discussions in context, let's say most of today's discussions in context, I will take a few more minutes to dwell on what Deccan was across this time period, the 16th and the 17th centuries, and the cultural world which it encompassed. Over this period, Deccan's vibrant and complex history is one of flourishing cultures, the most significant ones being Golconda under the Qutub Shahi dynasty and Bijapur under the Adil Shahi dynasty, complemented by the powerful Vijayanagara empire further south. The key to this flourish lay in the continuous ability of the affluent Deccani courts to attract artisans, writers, poets, musicians, architects and thinkers from all over the world primarily the Persianate world of Central Asia, Iran, and Turkey. The practice of patronizing the best human minds across ethnic, geographical, and cultural denominations also introduced unique technologies of craftsmanship as well as distinctive styles of architecture. Carrying this wealth of global knowledge systems, technological edge, human resources, and cultural diversity was the thriving maritime network across the Indian Ocean. This network brought the Persianate world into the Deccan through merchants, bureaucrats, Sufi saints, administrators, military commanders, horse suppliers, literary figures, 
philosophers, scholars, among else. All of those who contributed to the dissemination of epics, poetry, music, textual traditions, cuisine, textile, courtly rituals, art forms, dress, architecture, and more. It came to be sustained and institutionalized by the multiple and competing centers of royal patronage. These states were heavily dependent on ancient traders who supplied the horse on which functioned the military machinery of these kingdoms. Riding these Arab and Central Asian horses were ethnic Turks valued as archers in Vijayanagar as well as in the Northern Deccan. It was this lucrative trade which attracted thereafter the Portuguese, also inviting serious hostility with Asian traders. Deccan also served as a laboratory where the earliest experiments with gunpowder technology was also carried out. Kingdoms were receptive to this new technology, which subsequently came to be seen as nothing less than a revolution, which transformed the dynamics of state formation. Ottoman gunmen, Portuguese gunmakers, European specialists of cannon and matchlock, all descended into the region drawn by lucrative employment prospects. Driving political stability was a large military labor market which supplied slaves produced from the highlands bordering the coastline of East Africa, who were in great demand in all these kingdoms. They were subsequently trained in warfare and came to constitute an inseparable component of the army as well as the royal guards. Deccan was also the primary trading emporium in the Indian Ocean maritime network. From Africa to China, large quantities of items, luxury, and everyday products moved back and forth, bringing diverse ethnicities into the sprawling capital cities of this region. Movement of trading communities invariably brought cultural practices and material artifacts into the Deccan. To take the example of Qutub Shahi Golconda, it is no surprise that Chinese porcelain has been excavated in copious amounts from the mausoleum complex. Or in an equally unique display of cultural amalgamation, the opulently decorated Qutub Shahi tombs readily integrated motifs of the pineapple fruit and also perhaps the corn brought for the first time to India during the 16th century by the Portuguese from the New World or the Americas. None of these seem improbable when we keep in mind that Golconda was connected to the port of Masulipatna. On the other side, the fabled wealth of Golconda around large diamond mines was so well known that the name came to be used as a synonym for richness, prosperity, and opulence across the globe. 16th and 17th century onwards, Deccan was precisely the place where the world converged. Local speakers of Telugu, Marathi, Kannar, and Dakni Urdu rubbed shoulders with Persians, Central Asians, Ottoman Turks, Portuguese, Chinese, Africans, and Arabs, among others. Rulers of the Deccan were also great patrons of religion. Even a cursory glance at the magnificent temple architectures at Vijayanagar and the beautiful mosques and shrines across the northern Deccan attest this. But this did not stop the Vijayanagar courtly elite from participating in the transregional cosmopolitan world of the Persianate. This is evident through the adoption of architectural practices like the dome, the arches, the cross-vaulted arcades, and the use of columns in a series of structures that dot the royal center. This was the political nerve center of Vijayanagar, where people from diverse ethnic religions, cultural backgrounds converged together with the local population, allowing the state to project itself as self-consciously cosmopolitan as well as urbane. Something largely similar can also be said about Golconda under the Qutub Shahis, whose rulers, although they carried a distinct Shia identity, had earlier migrated from Iran in search for a career. Celebrating the onset of the second Islamic millennium, the Qutub Shahi Sultan embarked on a grand project of setting up a new capital city named Hyderabad in 1590s. Though the name invokes a strong Shia memory, it perhaps makes little sense to call Hyderabad as an Islamic city, per se. Rather, the metropolis is argued to have reflected a mixed cultural heritage strongly informed by the earlier capital city of Warangal under the Kakatiya monarchs. Significant parallels between Warangal and Hyderabad have been argued in the domains of layout and design rather than Iranian and Central Asian metropolises like Isfahan and Samarkand. A similarity in aesthetic vision also extended to the most recognizable structure of Hyderabad, the Charminar. 
In a unique display of architectural and cultural aesthetics, the Charminar combined arches, domes, four tall minarets, and a richly decorated mosque, all distinct Persianate elements with that of a large solar lotus, an iconic Indian symbol of life and energy, accompanied by small, smaller, 12 smaller lotuses placed around it in the manner of a zodiac calendar. This creative synthesis of Indic and Persianate cultural forms and practices is not startling when we see how the Qutub Shahi social structure in the 16th and the 17th centuries seamlessly integrated the Persian immigrant class with local Deccanese, along with Telangana's traditional Nayakwadi warriors and the Niyogi Brahmins. Then such dynamic cultural interactions and exchange speaks about a time and a space where Indic and Persianate worlds were not seen as incompatible. Belying our modern day assumptions of rigidly demarcated social boundaries in the pre-modern past. As an institution, Nalanda is committed towards investing in such sort of heritage and cultural dialogues and preserving this dialogue for days and generations to come. With these words, it's now the time to listen to our chief guest, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Abhay Kumar Singh, who will be giving today's welcome address. Professor Singh is a renowned historian of ancient Indian history, deeply invested in the field of India's in interconnections, Indo-Greek, Indo-Iranian connections. He has served in several reputed institutions throughout his life. Most recently, he had been the founding director at the Swami Vivekananda Cultural Center at the Indian Embassy of Tehran in Iran. He combines a glorious academic le legacy with that of being a very uh, uh, equally adept ad administrator. We welcome him for the welcome address, sir. Namaskar. <coughs> the honorable guests here, we have a very renowned Mr. Nanda here, who is the CEO of the Aga Khan Trust and a big conservationist. Mr. Sajjad, who is an engineer, our very honored guest who also specializes in the field of conservation. We have Dr. Bhattacharya Gautamiji, who is the uh, archeologist, and of course comes from the Archaeological Survey of India, Patna Circle, she is heading, who has to her credit a lot of excavation and conservation. We have again a wonderful young, a wonderful and active scholar, Umangji, who happily to say that he has been a student of Nalanda University, so we are very proud to have him here. The two ladies, scholars, Gangaji and uh, Archana ji from uh, Hyderabad. To all my deans, my colleagues, my professors, my the guests from the city, and the dear students, our registrar from the administration, I think that it's a very important event for us today, that we are having a symposium on what is lost, heritage, architecture, and culture. As I welcome you here, all of you, I feel that the price of what is lost, is known by only those who have lost their heritage. And the value of restoration of what has been endangered, what is about to be lost, also is, I think, the best assessed by those 
who are living in the times where they see that the heritage is also falling prey to vandalism, to threats of different kinds coming from different quarters, the cultural invasions and sort of, I think, very deceptive ways that the world is like today, people are reaching out to erase what has been somewhere very important for overall human existence. I point out to culture, I point out to environment, I point out to the historical monuments also. If we can assess the price of the lost heritage and if we can understand the value of what is threatened, I think we understand what the restoration means today. We understand that we have here with us those who are trying to redo and compensate us for the loss, putting life again to those places which had succumbed by different ways again. And here, we would then be able to judge the cost of restoration. The Aga Khan Trust, of course, His Highness, His Holiness, this Aga Khan Trust is doing commendable work all, all over the world, where we find that religion and philanthropy both with, with an objective with a sense of restoring the humanity to its real deserved place is participating all over the world and they are delivering also. A visit to the monuments in Delhi, which is nearest almost to, to us, would show to us that how these places have been protected and the work has also been of the highest quality. What does a monument stand for? I think since, since long past, when monuments came up, it is a memorial, basically it's a memorial, because stupas were memorials, tombs were memorials, and leaving aside the, that the other things that palaces and the temples and other uh, places for worship, that to have a sense like where we put our culture into an edifice, into a structure, it has the memory and then it is left for the future. The purpose of doesn't stop. It is, they are conveyors, they are something which, which are left by us to convey something to the next generation and the next thereafter. Nature has played its role as it does to our, as the, to our brains, to our memories, to fade away things. But nature's act has not been that destructive as it has been the act of the human beings. People have been more destructive. Whether it, it is out by way of a political, like you see, there have been invasions and people destructing the palaces, villages, towns, and monuments on the other side. Or it has been a normal tourist like me who goes and tries to write my name on different places, scratch things, damage things, touch things, destroy those things and all. Our own behavior has, in the society has also been in, in, a, in a way to neglect certain things. Because the monuments that we know and we are familiar, they become something which are meaningless. They lose their meaning to us. Like we lose our meaning in our relationships unless we lose them. The touch with the monument, the touch with our places of cultural heritage, the, the touch of that heritage that gives us the life, the force, the enthusiasm, 
That is only what keeps us going. The day we forget our ABCD and the tables and the mathematics, we will, everything would be useless. But we don't refresh our ABCD in the morning. It is there with us. The alphabet is there with us. The numerals are there with us. Suppose we forget it, then it's all lost. So entire existence, what is easily available to us, what keeps sustained our life, we lose interest into that. I am just coming to the point that the monument next door is the one that is that effect that is it is, ceases to inspire us because of our own mindset, and it becomes the monument of neglect to us. If we care to the next door, I think that we would be caring, doing the right type of service that we are expected to do as good citizens. Somebody else from far away comes, knows the value of it, and gives it the touch. And I think that the greatest service here of the Aga Khan Trust is that they have worldwide found places where they have come out, and those monuments which are not done by others, they are taking it up and doing it, putting them into their right place. I just want to appreciate this effort and the achievements are many. I think they're commendable. There's a great work that has been done. Today, in this symposium, if there is an awakening about looking to the next door monuments, I think the Intech had also done a great work in, into this, I remember, the old days. And they have still be doing it, is still trying to bring this. But I am again saying that it should be from inside, from our own selves, and as we have most of the people here who come from the School of Historical Studies, it would be my appeal to all of you to see that we try to start uh, this in uh, maybe something, it, in initially it would be something that we'll, we will have to develop, but then it becomes a routine with us that we are looking for something that needs to be protected. I would just say a few words about the School of Historical Studies because I would not uh, engage you more. I should have been talking about welcoming you more, but then I drifted to this side. Uh, the School of Historical Studies has, you know, the very talented colleagues of mine. It's not only engaging into just aspects of history, the political history, social history, we have also a good amount of archaeology courses in archaeology with us. As much as that we are now going thinking of having a separate master's program in archaeology, we have art, architecture, and archaeology from the earliest, from the prehistoric to the historical period. We would also be coming up with courses which uh, relate to um, the studies in culture, and the overall, we, because this is an interdisciplinary, uh, this uh, campus, you see the teaching here is interdisciplinary. We are also having courses in Buddhism from the Buddhist school. We have literature faculty, they, they have a school of literary, uh, literature languages and humanities. Environment, the school of environment and ecology. And also, management for sustainable development. So we are trying to develop courses where we can get the expert, like courses done where we can come up with course, with the type of um, academic input that we can provide to the students, uh, those avenues through which they can, maybe heritage management could come up, a museology could come up in future times. It depends on how our, uh, we plan it and how we get the support, and in this I appreciate your coming to Nalanda. I welcome you heartily to Nalanda on behalf of the university, all of and everybody, all of the Nalanda staff and the whole community. Uh, give us your ideas of, about your work and as well as what you would suggest to us to do would be very valuable to us. Uh, so a very warm welcome to you and I hope that this symposium would give us much more than we had even imagined since we know that uh, we have the, the most important people from your organization visiting us. Thank you all very, very much.
Thank you, sir, for the welcome remarks. Our first speaker for the symposium is Mr. Ratish Nanda, who is the CEO for the Agathon Trust for Culture in India. Mr. Nanda heads the interdisciplinary AKTC teams presently undertaking the two major urban conservation projects in India, the Nizamuddin Urban Renewable Initiative in Delhi and the Qutub Shahi Heritage Park <coughs> Conservation in Hyderabad. For AKTC, he was earlier responsible for the Bagh e Babar restoration between 2002 and 2006 in Kabul, Afghanistan, and the garden restoration of Humayun's tomb between 1999 and 2003. His major publications include Delhi, The Built Heritage, A Listing, followed by Delhi, Red Fort to Rizina, followed by Conservation of Historic Graveyards, followed by Re Rethinking Conservation, Humayun's Tomb. He studied architecture at the TVB School of Habitat Studies, Delhi, where he graduated with a gold medal. Mr. Nanda then did a master's program in conservation studies focused on built heritage at the Institute for Advanced Architectural Studies, University of York, England. A round of applause to welcome Mr. Nanda. Thank you, um, Dr. Ghani. Thank you also for having us. Um, thank you, Dr. Singh, Honorable Vice Chancellor. Very, very touched by your um, you know, very kind words of introduction. Um, it's a pleasure that Dr. Bhattacharya is also in this panel. Lovely meeting you again, ma'am. And my colleagues, uh, Sajad Saab, who's been a key advisor to us um, for the past decade or so at Hyderabad, uh, Arshna, um, Ganga Devi Ji, Umang, um, thank you. It's, it's, it's a real honor for us to be here, uh, all of us, and talking to all of you. Uh, we hope that at the end of it, there will be time for discussions or interaction, which would be welcome. Now, um, why rethinking conservation? Somebody will have to, I don't have my watch or anything, somebody will have to tell me when I'm nearing completion, otherwise I'll go on and on. Um, why rethinking conservation? Why do we even call it rethinking conservation? So for the last hundred odd years in India, conservation of the built heritage has been seen more as a burden rather than a means to a bigger objective, means to a greater objective. So what we at the Aga Khan Trust for Culture have been trying to do both in our projects in Delhi and in Hyderabad is demonstrate how conservation can actually fulfill several government objectives um, for our historic cities and for, um, for the country at, at large. Um, okay. So in the 1950s, 60s, His Highness the Aga Khan started you know, talking about the built heritage and how the built and living heritage and how this heritage is sometimes the only tool or only the stepping stone for needy communities in historic cities. And as a result, uh, is this on autopilot or what is it? Okay. Um, you're running it. Oh God, can I run it? Is it possible for me to run it myself? Oh God. Okay, that is very, very difficult for me to do. Anyway, so we working in um, several countries worldwide to demonstrate how the built heritage and the uh, intangible heritage can be leveraged for quality, improving quality of life of local communities. Um, our first thing in India really started at uh, Humayun's tomb, at the garden restoration of Humayun's tomb. And Humayun's tomb was really listed as a World Heritage Site in 1993. And one of the objectives of the 1993 designation or one of the conditions was that UNESCO said the gardens, which at that time were in this state, must be restored. So Archaeological Survey of India kindly sought our partnership and it's been an honor for the last 25 odd years working together with the ASI at this site and at other sites. So excavation, the pictures on the right, excavations at the uh, uh, site revealed significant fountain mechanisms. This itself pushed back garden history by over 100 years. Till then, most people believed 
that fountains were introduced by the Emperor Jahangir. Over here, it is uh, almost 100 years earlier. So uh, what did happen at uh, Humayun's tomb is we re needed to remove about 3,000 truckloads of earth to restore original levels. We had to hand chisel over two kilometers of sandstone uh, and also uh, major, major uh, excavations and uh, relifting of stone blocks that sometimes weigh two, 3,000 kilos to reset the garden. And this was really in fulfillment of the, of the UNESCO uh, requirements, but, um, but it also, the project also led to a significantly better understanding of this very significant garden. Next. Uh, so this is a before and after slide, which really shows the difference. And I could talk about this slide for an hour, but within this, there was so much study, excavations, repairs done that, uh, that uh, it, was, it was a very fulfilling partnership. We then, uh, we then were asked to come back to India to do more work in the field of culture in the public-private partnership model. And after reviewing 50 sites that the government of India had requested us to consider, we chose to come back um, to this Nizamuddin area. Now this is a painting by an architect called Himanish Das. It really shows how Nizamuddin was really created. This whole sacred landscape was created along the banks of the river Yamuna and within the uh, confluence of the river Yamuna with its own tributaries. So for 500 years, this was really a Mughal necropolis where not only Mughal, a necropolis which really uh, was the favored um, uh, place for building mausoleums for emperors and paupers alike. So in, uh, I will eventually get to the Deccan, but uh, over the last 15 years, we have, uh, we have been working on these three sites, the Humayun's Tomb Ensemble, the Government Sundar Nursery, which is a new park we created and now attract, last year attracted 1.15 million visitors, and the Hazrat Nizamuddin uh, Basti which is the densest ensemble of uh, medieval Islamic monuments, but also the most densely populated uh, settlement in all of Delhi and possibly all of India. And over here, we've done a variety of social economic projects and affected almost 100% of the local population. Next. <clears throat> Could we just go back to one slide? So these are the three project areas and together, uh, the project area is in excess of 300 acres where we have planted something like 20,000 trees, uh, restored 60 monuments and benefited a community of about 20,000 people with 20,000 floating population. Next slide. And this has been possible and this is key because so far when you talk about conservation, you talk about the Archaeological Survey of India or the departments of archaeology in the state. But over here, for an urban conservation project, which was really a development project, we had to sign a single MOU with the Central Public Works Department, the Municipal Corporation, as well as the Ar Archaeological Survey of India. And this is the reason what we do. I mean, for, uh, for many of us across different disciplines, we understand that education leads to an improved quality of life. We, we understand that Adequate health infrastructure leads to an adequate quality of life. But it's only now in the 21st century or 2025 that we understand that heritage is also an economic resource that communities can leverage to be able to improve their own quality of life. And the, His Highness the Aga Khan has been talking about this for about almost 50 years. <clears throat> I'm very glad uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor in his welcome address mentioned sustainability. Quite by chance, we have been able to, through a conservation project in the Humayun Storm Sundar Nursery in Nizamuddin area, been able to fulfill 15 of the 17 sustainable development goals through interventions such as creating economic opportunity, uh, addressing malnutrition, uh, providing health facilities which have been accessed by over 750,000 individuals, early childhood, uh, green, um, you know, planting tree saplings, et cetera, et cetera. Next. Now, um, 
the reason we chose to come back to Nizamuddin, come back to Humayun's tomb, was the possibility of doing conservation of a grand site, the World Heritage Site of Humayun's tomb. And we got significant support from the Tata Trust for this. Next. Uh, and almost every square inch of the building required significant interventions from the top, the finial, to the foundations. And this took us about eight years. And overall in this project, we've done about 1.5 million man days of uh, craftsman work. So we, through conservation project, also helping revive crafts, but also create significant amounts of employment. Next. So this, this uh, was really the departure point where we realized that we had been given this very significant responsibility by the Archaeological Survey of India. We realized that to really restore the significance or enhance the significance, the cultural significance of the Humayun's Tomb World Heritage Site and other monuments, we needed to go back to a craft-based approach. This required reviving many crafts that had been lost, such as the craft of tile making, such as the craft of mother of pearl inlay. Uh, but essentially, this has been the backbone of our uh, conservation effort, is actually to engage with craftsmen as part of the team. Next. Also, significant scientific research. So we had access to uh, international, national and international laboratories. And with that, we're able to bring the science of the highest scientific uh, advancement to a conservation project. The top left picture is actually of a monument where the cement uh, plaster was applied on top of uh, early 16th century wall painting. And when we started removing the cement, we found this wall painting being of real gold and real lapis, uh, which is a signal. And now this is known as the earliest uh, uh, wall paintings on any Islamic building anywhere in the world. Next. Um, the Darga of Hazrat Nizamuddin Aulia, and uh, I know Dr. Ghani has a special interest in uh, Sufism, is really the epicenter of the Humayun's tomb, World Heritage Site, the epicenter of the Nizamuddin area. It was really around this, this, this tomb, which is the small white tomb, uh, the Darga, that for 500 years, large, small mausoleums have been built in a radius between the river and, and towards the north. So we have over 100 monuments around this structure. And talking about community partnership, uh, this, this mosque which you see, uh, has we've had to do major conservation works, remove layers and layers of paint faces, restore missing stonework, and also uh, address uh, other conservation needs such as water seepage and so on. Next. So this is just a before and after view of the same mosque building. Now, uh, local communities who are custodians of this heritage uh, in their best interests have over the years plastered over intricate stonework, painted it uh, with modern colors which have a huge negative impact on the stone itself. So we've taken four or five years to remove this, uh, this stone and plaster and the sense revealed a lot of this incredible historic uh, work that is now again visible to people visiting the mosque. Next. I'm not going to go through every monument that we have restored, but just, just to give you an idea, we talked about Humayun's tomb in the Humayun's tomb complex. We talked about uh, the Jamaat Khana mosque in the Darga complex. And this is a monument called Sundar Burj. Now, those of you who know a little bit of Hindi, Sundar Burj is really beautiful dome. And this building stood in the middle of a traffic island um, in Sundar Nursery. And next slide, please. And we have we've since been able to remove the road, uh, restore the lime plaster uh, ornamentation, and create a little charbag around it. And most importantly, next slide, restore the Sundar Burj, restore the uh, intricate dome that uh, uh, this building had. Next slide, please. Now, all of this effort has collectively, and this is a significant achievement for any conservationist, all of this effort collectively has led to the expansion of the World Heritage Site from a single monument to 14 monuments. So now uh, the World Heritage Site, next slide, has expanded from being 26 acres in 1993 to over 200 acres in 2016. Next. 
Uh, these projects have since been recognized with multiple UNESCO awards uh, for Nizamuddin Basti, these two awards, and next slide, uh, for Sundar Nursery, these two awards. Now, coming to our uh, principal objective of today's um, um, seminar is the Qutub Shahi tombs. Now, this is probably the world's most unique necropolis. It's one of India's most significant sites. And again, it's been an honor to work alongside the Department of Archaeology and Museums here for the last decade. And, um, you know, when we started, all Hyderabadis call it the seven tombs. So we thought seven monuments, fine. This has turned out to be over 100 individual structures in one necropolis, dating from every decade of the Qutub Shahi rule. Uh, again, uh, to do this work, next slide please, we had to enter into a partnership, as I said, with the Department of Heritage, Government of Telangana, used to be Department of Archaeology and Museums, um, now, and the Kuli Qutub Shah Urban Development Authority, as well as ourselves. Both the Department of Heritage own and the Kuli Qutub Shah Urban Development Authority own portions of this 106 acre site, which we are now trying to integrate. Next, this is how uh, the tombs were visible in 1902 from the Golconda fortifications. So this is a photograph taken in 1902 from Golconda looking towards the tomb. This is a similar photograph taken in 1971. You'll notice that not much changed between 1902 and 1971. And 1991, again, not much has changed. It's looking more green because it's a color photograph, but not much has changed. And then this happened. So essentially over the last two decades, last 20 years, this site is now today hemmed in by the expanding city of Hyderabad. Um, so when we're really talking about the site, we're very fortunate that the Department of Heritage or Department of Archaeology and Museums has been able to save this site. Uh, but, uh, but a uh, lot more effort is required, and that is what we've been at it. So what does the site really um, have? It has about 40 mausoleums. It's got about 20, what I call funerary mosques. Funerary because in Orthodox Islam, it is considered uh, inappropriate to have a, a tomb. Some Orthodox uh, Muslims don't want to be buried. So you're buried in a courtyard, and a mosque is built around it. So the family can pray for the well-being of the person buried here. We also have eight baulis and uh, several wells. Uh, we have garden enclosures and we have um, uh, a hammam. Next. So from the very onset, when you're trying to rethink conservation, and especially in India and in some of our other countries, I think the key thing is that the heritage conservation movement needs to ride piggyback on the uh, environmental or green movement. And uh, Professor Muhammad Shahir uh, was a landscape architect for this as well as Sundar Nursery and Humayun's tomb. Uh, and we started with significant amount of surveys that, uh, that enabled us to create uh, a master plan for the site. Now what the master plan does is on the right side of the picture, which is, which is really here, I know they're trying to record it. Um, this becomes more of a facility zone, while the north and the south become uh, ecological buffers for the, for the heritage site. And uh, so this was, uh, this was the master plan. Next slide, please. Um, and then when we started the conservation effort, this is Sultan Kuli Qutub Shah's tomb, this is the first of the dynastic maus mausoleums that were built here. We realized that 20th century, there was a lot of cement covering the uh, historic work and the stucco work. So we, next slide. This is a before and after view of, uh, of just removing 20th century cement layers and restoring the historic stucco patterns. Next. Similarly, when I went to Hyderabad, and this is very important from those of us in the historical cities, uh, historical studies uh, fields. Uh, when I first went to Hyderabad, everybody said, you know, these are not the Mughals. They did not have enclosed gardens. 
these tombs were all sitting in the wider landscape. But for, uh, we found at least four significant garden enclosures, including that of Sultan Kuli. So we found remains of this enclosure wall, next slide, uh, which we have been able to uh, reconstruct. And this again is very significant from a art history, art uh, history of architecture point of view, that Sultan Kuli's tomb, which is banged there in the center, is really, uh, you know, surrounded, was set in an enclosed garden. Next. Some of these structures are enormous. There are four buildings on this complex which have a similar height to that of Humayun's tomb, uh, over 40 meters in height. Now to have four buildings over 40 meters in height in the same complex is an enormous, uh, is something, something quite uh, dramatic. But the problems are also with large buildings, the problem is also that to do the conservation work, which is based on archival research, based on study of uh, what exists on the site, in situ uh, studies, we remove tons and tons of cement. And once you remove all of that, you need to replaster this with lime. But with a dome of this size, if you have three masons doing this or four masons doing this, you would have about 20, 30 joints. So to prevent any joint, all of this work on the replastering of the dome is usually done overnight. And uh, at any time, we've had about 30, 40 people working together. And you can see that picture, you know, the scale of the building is visible from, you know, how, how tiny or ant-like human beings look. Next slide. Also, as I, as I already mentioned, the gardens um, were quite obliterated, quite badly obliterated. So what you see is this is the main garden and you see all sorts of cement uh, fixtures, the cement lampposts, the jalis at the bottom of the picture. On the top right picture is the cement uh, bridge. And when we demolished this bridge, because it's all a 20th century inappropriate addition to the garden, all hell broke loose in Hyderabad because apparently Lady Diana had stood on this bridge and been photographed. So they used to call it Lady Diana's Bridge, but of course we've knocked it down. Next slide. Uh, in the process, we found significant archeology, span archeological remains, aqueducts and so on. And uh, the new landscape, which is the next slide, had to incorporate all of these elements. Next. Again, when we went to Hyderabad, we had to buy water. We had to buy water for our conservation needs and for our horticulture needs. And then we realized there are these historic step wells on the site, uh, which were in this condition. And six of them um, we, we have been able to find and, and restore. Um, next. Um, so this is a whole thing of the Badi Bauli, four pictures from the collapse to the conservation to the reconstruction and then the final, final uh, conservation effort. Next. So this is the Bauli. This now itself holds over 3.5 million liters of rainwater every monsoon. Next. The Eidgah Bauli. Again, some of the structures are 40 meters high. This one is 30 meters below ground. So it's, it's an incredible, for me, this is the most striking of all buildings in the Qutub Shahi tomb complex. It's a bauli that goes down almost uh, seven, seven stories. Next. Some of the other ones which we found in really ruinous condition and have been able to restore. Next. Um, and so we've divided the whole site up into catchment areas. So we collect almost 21 liters of water every rainfall. Next. 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 And this again uh, was recognized with the UNESCO award uh, two years ago. Next. This, these are my last uh, few slides and are really the fun slides. So what we've done consistently through the 60, 70 major monuments at the Qutub Shahi tombs is remove 20th century cement layers. And when we started removing cement layers from this building called the Muhammad Qutub Shah's tomb, he was the son-in-law and successor of Muhammad Kuli Qutub Shah who established Hyderabad and Charminar. To our amazement, we found not lime, but actually remnants of tiles. So glazed tiles would have covered this tomb in, in completion. Now, 
as you will see from the next uh, slide, we were able to find fragments of the colored tiles as well. And this is the kind of evidence we conservationists need to be able to recommend a restoration of the original finish. Next slide. And some of these patterns are beautiful um, and really uh, bring light to a significant aspect of the Qutub Shahi culture, which was earlier not known or uh, forgotten about. Next. There are other things. Portions of the site had become a large parking ground, which, next slide, which we have now recovered and restored to gardens. Next. And this is, this is now almost, almost being built, except for the museum, which you will see next slide, is a large underground facility. Now, when you come, when a, a visitor comes to a site like this, which is standing at the foot of Golconda fortification, the idea is that you explain the cultural context of the site at an interpretation center or a museum, and that is now being built. Uh, by the Telangana, and this is designed by a firm called Lotus. Um, so this is what, if it ever gets built, will, will appear like. So just the next few slides in quick succession. Uh, next. And this is a rooftop garden of uh, what will be the site museum. Next. No, next. And all of these projects are really done by building partnerships. So these are some of the partners we've been able to build, build uh, partnerships with to implement these projects both in Delhi and Hyderabad. Next. And again, as I said, the project is really craftsman uh, uh, focused. And we've had over 1.5 million man days of craftsman work. Next. And an interdisciplinary team. So there are about 20, 25 disciplines in that photograph. It's a bit dated. so. You won't find Omang in that photograph, but um, otherwise there are, there are uh, at least 20, 25 different disciplines in that photograph. Next. And that is my last slide. Thank you very much. It uh, was a pleasure talking to you and look forward to further interaction later in the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nanda, for the very detailed and informative lecture and for sharing with us the rare and the valuable photographs. Our next speaker brings us closer home. Dr. Gautami Bhattacharya from the ASI will speak on uh, the project in Lucky Sarai. Dr. Bhattacharya, joined the Archaeological Survey of India in 2016 as Deputy Superintending Archaeologist in Excavation Branch Patna. For a brief period, she was part of the Excavation Branch Bhuvaneshwar and is currently associated with the Patna Circle. So far, she has carried out excavations at four sites. One of these sites is a multicultural habitation site, and the remaining three are Buddhist religious sites. Dr. Varajarya, please. Very good afternoon to all of you. Um, I was very happy seeing the, the theme of the symposium. And I was not prepared. I was preparing for something else. But I thought that I could work around it. Um, you see, Archaeological Survey of India has two basic mandates with which it started way back whenever it, uh, when it started. And it is uh, enshrined in the 1915 Act also that the two main verticals of ASI are one research oriented and the other is of course the conservation. And since I saw the speakers who are coming in, they are going to speak on the conservation aspects that they have taken up in various parts of the country. I thought I would be the change in the flavor for the symposium and would concentrate on the archeological aspect of restoring because that is also what restoration takes up. Because uh, as you'll see from my case study of Orain, which I had, uh, this was the first excavation that I uh, undertook as a director. Uh, I was just a deputy superintending archaeologist at that time. And I had joined the Archaeological Survey of India in 16. And this, is, uh, this was started in 2016. We carried out excavations for two years at Orain. 
And uh, as uh, Professor uh, Abhay Singh had said in the opening remarks also, that we tend to neglect culture because sometimes it is too close to our eyes and we kind of neglect it. So uh, you'll see in the photographs that I'll show through my presentation that Oren is actually a multicultural habitation site and the current village is also sitting on top of it. So basically this is more than 2000 years of history, of culture, of archeology, span of heritage that is a living site and it's continuing in existence today also. So we try to explore its antecedent phases and make the people realize there also who are sitting presently the village that is being inhabited that what is there beneath their foundation, foundation of their humble homes. So uh, I'll just proceed with that and hopefully I'll be able to keep track of the time. So I have the watch in my hand. So uh, please, next slide. Uh, this is, uh, as I say, very closer home. It's in the Lakhi Sarai district. And uh, uh, as students of historical studies, you would appreciate or you would know that there are very few excavated sites towards the east of Bihar. Uh, Bhagalpur, in Bhagalpur particularly, Vikram Shila is an important site and which is, uh, which is protected by the Archaeological Survey of India. And then there are two or three sites which have been excavated, Paisra being a prehistoric site which was excavated by Vidula Jaiswal of BHU. That has prehistoric antecedents there. Uh, Oriyappa village, again very close to Vikram Shila, which again gives a, a, a multicultural uh, and a multi-habitation uh, site. And uh, this is further, it is uh, midway between uh, you can say uh, Bhagalpur and Patna. So this was uh, comparatively a uh, uh, virgin area so far as excavations would go because a uh, number of uh, scholars had visited the area. They had reported about the mounds there. They had reported about the sculptures there. This is a very rich area where you get a lot of uh, sculptural wealth in the form of uh, stone uh, sculptures. Uh, which is very renowned so far as South Bihar goes, but uh, habitation-wise, very few sites have been excavated, and this was one of the sites that we took up uh, from Patna Excavation Branch. Next, please. Uh, if you would uh, 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 have some idea about uh, the historical background of uh, Bihar as such also, if I come closer home, you know every time the famous figure that we get is of Alexander Cunningham. He would be the first pioneer who would be telling you about the different sites that have been uh, spread across uh, in uh, across Bihar, especially connected with Buddhism. But this particular site of Orain was noted by L.A. Waddell, and he had published a good amount of it in the Journal of Asiatic Society of Bengal in 1892. And he was the first person who identified the site as being the place where Buddha had spent his 16th Varshavas. Buddha, as you would know that during, or even um, uh, they would, the monks would travel all around, but during the rainy season, they would try to stay for three or four months at one place. Because in rainy season, it would be difficult to traverse uh, long distances. So this was one of the place which was hallowed by the presence of Buddha himself. So after this came out, a number of people from the Archaeological Survey of India in, the, in, uh, in various administrative capacities, like from the Eastern Circle, there was T. Bloch who had visited the site. Then D.C. Sarkar, a famous epigraphist, he had gone in search of uh, inscriptions there because Waddell reported finding uh, inscriptions there, dated inscriptions of the Pal ruler. So uh, that was uh, earlier done. Then Aki Chattopadhyay from the University of Calcutta, he had visited the site, he had explored the site, and he for the first time came out that it was a well-known early historical site showing continuous occupation up to the early medieval phase. This was the first time that someone had uh, brought to face that it was not just the sculptures, because uh, as I'll show you in the following uh, slides, because uh, when we take a cursory glance across the village or we walk, walk through the lanes of the villages, we found a lot of sculptures there, which would, uh, uh, sculptures which were having Buddhist affiliation as well as Brahmanical affiliation. So that was very obvious to anyone. But to f say that it had a long antecedent phase, that was done by Professor Chattopadhyay. And he was my supervisor in, for my PhD, and it was under his uh, inspiration that I took up this first excavation work at Oren. Uh, this is a Google map, as you will see. Uh, towards the north of it is the village proper. You can see how densely inhabited uh, that area is. To the back is a hillock. It's a granite hillock, which is known as Barki Pahadi or Orain Pahadi. That is towards the south, and the village in front would extend towards the north. Next. 
Uh, these are again preliminary investigations. On the Badki Pahadi itself, we took a uh, drone photograph and there was an earthen tumulus on top. That is the top view that you can see uh, towards. And then uh, a part of the uh, this earthen tumulus had been cut off. So we got ready exposed section there, we, which we just cleaned up. We didn't touch the area because uh, people had religious beliefs uh, regarding it. So we didn't want to disturb them or create any kind of situation. But we could manage to see through the section that there were layer, as you can see, there were stratified layers of bricks and mud and some kind of a concreting material had also been used in the upper layers. Next. Uh, this is, uh, we found on the uh, hillock that we found uh, towards the uh, south side, as I said, there were engravings of stupas. So uh, basically the white line that you see is because we have chalked in those uh, lines because otherwise the photographs wouldn't have been clear. This was done as part of our documentation process. We used the chalk to uh, under, uh, score through the uh, uh, engraved areas and then photograph it. Then we found some of the inscriptions, as I said, uh, DC Sarkar had uh, reported inscription. Now this arrowhead inscription that you saw, uh, see is of a Bhaik Shukhi script. This is a script which is not very commonly used. This script was in fact very, uh, it was used among the Buddhist yeah, um, uh, universities or even in local, uh, uh, um, what do I say? localities which were connected with the Buddhism only. It was not a very commonplace script that would be used. So, uh, so the finding of this site suggests that it was a Buddhist establishment was there at Orain which were using this kind of script. And then we found evidence of rock extraction and uh, chessboard pattern which, were, which we normally find at a number of sites, amusement and games as such. Next. Uh, this is how we documented. You can see that the further, uh, the uh, votive stupa that has been, the stupa that has been engraved, it is very difficult to make out the complete uh, profile of it. So we chalked it off and thereafter we made the full scale, uh, traced it on the uh, zero scale and thereafter AutoCAD drawings of the said word drawing for documentation purposes. Next. Again the same thing, how it is being done. Next. Uh, then we took a round, as I said, we took a round around the villages uh, to see uh, what the uh, village on its surface shows. The, even the houses, the walls that are there, since they were making, these are very humble abodes, they were making it with their own uh, the material that they were getting. So the mud even had such a good concentration of pottery. Large storage jars were just lying there on the field. Uh, next. And these are some of the structural remains that are clearly visible on top. And as I said, sculptural remains uh, abound in the villages. So these are readily available. Uh, next. Now, as, I, as you could see in the first photogram which I had shown, it was a completely inhabited site. So how do you excavate a site which is also the present habitation is sitting on top of it? So we thought we'll make use of the best possible. So we decided that we'd lay out trenches, small trenches wherever possible. Firstly, we wanted to concentrate on the four sites and the top high portion of the mound. So in total, we took up five to seven trenches depending on the area that we got. Next. Uh, this was the index trench. Uh, we identify index trench as one trench where we get the continuous sequence of habitation. This trench, fortunately for us, was uh, the space was enough for us uh, to go down to the complete natural soil. This was taken in right in the center of the mound, and uh, it had a complete uh, deposit of 16 meters. Next. Uh, you can see that towards one side, you would see that there are a number of structures. So the problem is, if you go down, the space for working gets lesser and lesser. So either you have to remove those structures after, of course, complete documentation. We do documentation through photographs and drawings and everything. But still, uh, we prefer that if, it, if at all we find a place where we can d go down without disturbing much of the structure, we're trying to uh, uh, take use of, make use of that. So this corner, right-hand uh, right side corner, was very difficult for us because there are a number of structures, and these structures were of different way. There were Pal structures, there were Gupta structures, there were Kushan structures, and they were overlapping each other. So we decided that even the small places where we could manage, we would just excavate. So one person would be sitting and excavating. That is the limited space we had. But on the other side, we could easily go down. So we uh, went down there. Next slide, please. And this was the entire deposit that you can see. This is a 16 meter deposit. And uh, it, it gave us the complete sequence of the site of Orain. And um, we have to maintain, as you can see, 
the trenches, the box have been uh, scarred because of rainfall. That is not a very ideal situation. Whenever this kind of situation happens, what we do is we tend to push back the wall and we again scrape it off. But to take that scraping off, because we were nearing the end of our season and this was the second season of excavation, and if we had pushed back even further, we would have to take it down to 16 and a half meters, which would be wasting a lot of time. So we let it remain as it is. And by the time we had uh, documented everything, next. Uh, this was uh, towards the eastern uh, end of the mound, the different trenches, next. This was again on the eastern end of the mound. Here you can see the photograph uh, would uh, show a ring well. That is a ring well that has been dug into the natural soil. Now, the natural soil is one where we find no evidence of human activity. That we call as a natural soil. The natural soil above, above the natural soil would be stratigraphic layers, which would uh, basically have cultural evidences belonging to different periods of time. At the, at the point where we stop get, getting evidence of any human occupation, that is the uh, layer we identify as a natural soil or virgin soil. And this particular ring well was in fact completely dug into the natural soil. So this proved that this particular area, the first human activity was digging that uh, ring well and thereafter the st uh, habitation started. Next. Uh, this is towards the north of the mound where we excavated uh, three trenches in fact. So these are the three trenches towards the north of the mound. Here also we went down till the natural soil so that we do not miss any occupational level at the northern side. Next. This is uh, URN4 was to the west of the village. Uh, this was taken uh, again you can see the last or the in fact the first habitation evidence was in the form of a well now earlier what you had seen was a terracotta ring well this is an unlined well you can see the difference in the color so that dark patch is the unlined well that was uh, that was present at the site later on the uh, well was uh, covered up and habitation started so this was the unlined well that we got from the urn4 next this URN 4, 5 was a very interesting trench for us. This was uh, this what we excavated towards the south of the village beyond the Burki Pahadi area. This gave evidence of iron working. Well, there was no habitation deposit as such, but it had tons and tons of iron slags which we I uh, which we collected, and there were two years we found which gave evidence. And even you can see the natural soil that you see here is sprinkled generously with reddish patches. That would suggest that there is something which is uh, iron based, whether it would be hematite or something. So they were using this particular area, this particular region of the habitation for production of iron, iron implements. Next. And this is what the chronocultural sequence that we arrived at at Uren after two years of excavation. Uh, we have divided it into six periods, which started with uh, BRW is basically we identified the black and redware pottery. So basically that is black and redware associated rural settlement. Then it was the black slipware associated rural settlement. We try to identify a based on the pottery because that is a very positive indicator that we get in any archaeological horizon. And whichever is prolific, we try to name it after them. Then of course the famed NBP, now we are present, we are basically in the early historical period. Then come the dynastic periods, the Shunga and Kushan, then the Gupta and the early medieval which would be post-Gupta and Pal period. So this was a cultural sequence. Now I'll try to run through the characteristics of each uh, cultural uh, which we got there. The first one which we said was the black and red were associated rural settlement. So this was basically the point where Urain village was settled for the first time. And it was a very incipient village. It did not have much of an infrastructure. The only evidence of a habitation that we could gather were these post holes. These small, small holes that you see, which we have excavated in half, are basically post holes. So there would be logs which would be standing upright. There would be some kind of a thatched roof over it, very rudimentary, and a very and the deposit itself was not very rich also. So whenever man started settling in Urain, this was the first phase where he started doing it. Next. This is the pottery that we got. You, as I said, we identified it as a black and red wear. The first photograph that you can see, the, uh, the black, you can see around the neck outside. The inside also would be black and the outside would be red. 
So that is the black and red ware, that is the marker pottery for this particular period, which is also said to be uh, another common term that you use is chalcolithic. Why I, we at branch did not use chalcolithic for this particular period was because we did not get copper. Chalco is basically copper plus lithic. We did not get evidence of a copper based any industry here. So we tended to avoid that term and instead we focused on the pottery which was very frequent there. So we got the black and red ware pottery and some of the uh, shapes that you can say we found the perforated sheds, we found the um, spring, uh, sorry, Dishon stands. Those are the stem parts of the Dishon stands that we found. Next. Next was the black and black slipped wear period. The period two was again black slipped wear. Here also, there isn't much change in the habitation. Uh, the habitation may be continued to flourish simply as a rural village, but it since uh, they have started settling for a long period, there is improvement in their pottery traditions. We found that improvement. You can see the black pot potsherds that you see on the first two uh, plates over there. They have a kind of shine on them. The pottery texture is also different. So there is progress in the pottery. So you can identify those things. So black slipped wear are the first two uh, plates that you see. Red wear, of course, continued there. And then you get decoration in the form of white dots that you see. These kind of decorated pottery are also found from other excavated sites, known excavated sites in Bihar, prominent being the Chiran site. So we go, uh, uh, there, there, is, uh, there is no, it's not that Uren is giving a very different picture. It is basically following the same line which we found in other excavated sites, particularly in the Middle Ganga Plain or in Bihar. Next. Now we come to the Northern Black Polished Ware period or the early historic time. Now this is the period where there is a qualitative and quantitative change in the habitation history of Oren. Large part of the mound now started. Earlier this habitation would, I would also like to say that the BRW, the period one and period two settlement, the evidence of those two settlements were found only in the central part and in the eastern part of the village. Not in the western, not in the northern, not in the southern part of the village. But when we are coming to the northern black polished ware period, we find that the habitation is extending further south. North, it has still not, it has still not expanded to north side, but the uh, cultural deposit has drastically changed. So this was, uh, this was towards the southeast of the uh, mound. Uh, here we found a pit, a circular pit in the natural soil. You can see the change in the color. The dark is basically the cultural deposit there. The yellowish or the lighter part is basically the natural soil. So here a circular pit was dug into the natural soil. So first we, we started removing those black the cultural deposit within the circular area. So we continue uh, digging that. Next. And when that deposit ended, we found that same terracotta ring well, which I was mentioning it earlier. So this was the first habitation activity that took place in the, during the Northern Black Polished Ware period where expansion of the settlement at, uh, at Uren took place. And this particular ring well, it is, there are 63 rings in it. These uh, terracotta rings are 63 in numbers. And I think the nearest comparison would be from the site of Telora Court, which uh, in Nepali Starai, which also had approximately 62 or 63 rings. Otherwise, such a big, such a lengthy terracotta ring well has not yet been found from any other sites apart from Oren and earlier also reported from Telora Court. Next. Now, we all know that this period is very famous for its pottery. So here is uh, some of the pottery fragments that we found from the period three. The first is your graveyard shirts. Now this is very fine graveyard and if you would strike two pieces of graveyard, you would get the metallic sound. The famed metallic sound which we found in the northern black wear polish, the same thing is found in the, so now we are coming into deluxe pottery. Gray wear is basically table wear. It is a deluxe pottery, it was not used for uh, rough use. It was a tableware pottery and so would be the shirts of NBP. As you can see, some of the shirts of NBP were also found. Now NBP that you found find from important sites like maybe when you excavate Rajghat, maybe when you excavate Patliputra, which are basically the centers of Magadhan or the Mauryan Empire, the quality would be much finer. This site of Uren being in the peripheral zone has NBP, but the pottery, uh, deal, uh, the uh, fineness is not to that extent. It cannot be compared to that extent. Now, very interesting is the last corner slide that you can see. 
this has roulated design the design that you can see on it is a roulated design uh, this uh, we had a hunch that uh, this could be a roulated design shirt but since we haven't uh, we hadn't till that time handled much of this uh, fortunately for us professor k krishnan had come down from ms university baroda he has worked a lot on uh, roulated shirts and he said that this is uh, basically an imitation roulated they tried to not the original roulated but they tried to make it on a fine black wear they tried to have that kind of roulated design so uh, if uh, roulated you uh, were shirts are basically found along the coast you will find along the coast uh, eastern coast if you go down and even uh, even in sri lanka and other southeast asian countries uh, roulated shirts are very common but in india as you go further north their number keeps on decreasing so this is so far as inland sites are there finding of roulated shirt is quite interesting here next coming to the antiquities that we get so these are some of the specimen antiquities these are these are these belong to period 3 the nbp period i would like to draw your attention to the uh, figure of the lady she has very non indic features these are basically not the common uh, female terracotta figurines that we find across any uh, horizon of this period so the non indic feature of this of this particular image is very interesting because finding such a figure would not have been so uh, eye catching had it been in rajghat had it been in patliputra or other sites which were in frequent community which were in frequent trade relation but finding this site in urain which is basically a peripheral region we are talking about a region which is at the juncture of the kalakpur hills and the ganga plains is quite interesting so this would throw light on what urain was during the nbp period and the role that it had played next now coming to the next period that is the chunga kushan this is again the period where urain proliferated like anything mane the there was a boom in the habitation so to say the habitation spread to different parts of the mount now now we are getting evidence of chunga kushan period from the northern side of the mount from the eastern side of the mount from the western side of the mount so this was the period when the habitation expanded through a uh, space also at the site and structural activities came in in a big way you can see brick structures coming in those are the bricks and those are the ramped floor with again post holes next uh the these are a very interesting find we get is of the bricks uh, a very peculiar feature of kushan period structures you would see across most of the middle ganga plain sites would be complete bricks would be used when if at any time you find complete bricks are being used of a particular size then you can be sure of, uh, that they would be kushan period bricks as you can see here also the interesting side uh, uh, photograph here is the corner one the bottom one where you find stacks of tiles there you know that the roof would be built of tiles we get fragments of tiles in excavation and we assume that tiles have been used for roofing purpose but here we are getting it stacked in uh, so that would show that it, the tiles needed to be repaired after maybe every rainy season or annually so this is a perfect example of how people would be stacking the things in their houses to be used whenever it needed to be used for the next time so this is a very good example that we found a beautiful stacking of tiles in the in situ next again uh, we found a lot of burning activity in the eastern part of the uh, mound uh, there was uh, uh, the deposit was very hard to break through so we we continued digging and digging and finally we found this is again this is the same trench where we found the terracotta ring well of the nbp period so here we found a partial evidence of a furnace this the corner photograph that you see is of a furnace that we found here it most probably bricks and something like this would would have been baked here uh, since the area was small we could not expand it much further to know the with certainty what it would have been used for but this is what we get and there is another interesting find that we found from this uh, trench only which would come in the next slide next please uh, this one here we found a little this uh, a small broken pottery and this pottery had these tokens there though the rounds that you think are terracotta tokens there and all these tokens had one symbol 
same symbol all through it. There are 17 or 18 of this which we had found. Earlier we had found them in the course of excavation, so they were basically one or two. But here we found a total cache of all these things. So basically this was used as tokens for possibly a mercantile guild or something. You know, this was kind of an identification symbol. This was not a ceiling bearing personal names or a monastery name or something like that. It would possibly be a token which would be circulated among the members of a particular guild or a particular group of uh, people. So this was an interesting find and this is sitting on top of the, in, on, in parallel with the uh, furnace that I had shown you in the previous slide. So the uh, presence of furnace and the presence of cache of tokens suggests that it was possibly related to a mercantile guild which were identifying their members through these tokens. Next. This is again a very important shirt. This is known as the knobbed wear. Like the related wear, knobbed wear is closely associated with Buddhism and closely associated with trade. Related wear shirts and knobbed wear shirts are found mostly together along the eastern coast of India, also in the Southeast Asian countries, and they have as a close association with Buddhism. So here we found one shirt of, related, uh, of uh, this knobbed wear, and as you can make out, there is one people leaf depiction there and three floral motifs are there. Again, it's a very fine wear shirt. Next. Now we come to the next Gupta period. Gupta period was again, uh, it consolidated, Uren consolidated, it's standing as a habitation site. As I said, in Kushan period, you would find bricks would be used, complete bricks would be used. In Gupta period, invariably throughout Middle Ganga Plain, what you would find is reused bricks. They would basically be using bricks which were uh, coming from the structures of the Kushan period. So reused bricks would be broken bricks. You would hardly find complete bricks there. Maybe one or two specimens, but largely the, they would be reused bricks. So here also at Oren also we find the same story where reused bricks were used for making structures of the Gupta period. And they were sitting on top of the structures of the Kushan period. And uh, the corner evidence are kind, you can see two, three hearths are there, uh, one below the other. So possibly there was a community kitchen-like setup in this particular. The, these evidences are coming from the north part of the uh, habitation. Next. Uh, this is again the central part of the mount, the index trench that I was talking to you about. Uh, here we found a large quantity of charred grains in association with Gupta period walls. You see those closely related parallel walls and small, these are basically the Gupta period walls and we found this charred grains, that black uh, patch that you can see in the top image, that was where we found these charred grains. We, uh, we collected these grains. We uh, cleaned them through flotation techniques and could identify some of the grains that were there. Next. Uh, thereafter, we come to the early medieval period, which is basically uh, the top, the latest habitation there, archaeological habitation there. We found evidence of this kind of, uh, this, uh, this trench was partly excavated in the first end and partly excavated in the second season. So in the first season, we found the first photograph, which you can see a kind of a circular structure that is coming around and a small uh, wall abutting it. Next year when we reopened, no, previous year. Next year when we re reopened that trench again and we expanded it further, we found that the long wall was continuing and that uh, circular portion was also taking a shape. Next. So this is basically what we found of the, the long wall and the circular portion. And the, the bottom picture is of Vikram Shila site protected by the ASI. Why I'm showing this picture is because I have identified, our team has identified this particular evidence as suggesting of a Mahavihar structure in Uren. So because as you can see here also in the photograph from Vikram Shila, you have a long wall against which would be cells, monastic cells, and then these walls, since this is a very long wall, they would be uh, uh, trying to have some kind of uh, bastion-like structures to give structural stability to that long walls. So these structural stability was imparted through these circular bastions, and in the case of Vikram Shila, they would alternate between a circular bastion as well as a rectangular bastion. At Urain, we have got evidence of a circular bastion connected with a long wall. Next. Uh, these are other structural remains that we found from the Pal period. Uh, the first 
a photograph that you can see here gives a beautiful example of how the foundation of that structure was made. They are using basically blocks of stone for foundation and thereafter they are raising the PAL level structure. Again, the brick size of PAL period would be different and they would be using complete bricks, which is not the case of the Gupta period structures, which are using basically reused bricks. So here is a beautiful evidence of how they are making the foundation of a structure and raising thereafter the wall. Next. These are some of the antiquities that we got from, uh, now these are not any period wise. We got bone, bone tools are there, antlers are there, stone tools are there. And these are coming from, these do not belong to a particular, we, like we are getting them from the period one, we are getting from period two, we are getting them from period three. So they are coming from all across the cultural spectrum. Uh, uh, shell bangles are there which are commonly used and uh, semi-precious stone beads are there, terracotta stone beads are there. Next. Uh, gamesmen's are there, uh, that is a two year that you can see I was talking about. In the center is a beautiful uh, bone, uh, this was basically a bone comb and it is a depiction of swastik on one end, shank on one end, then there's a fish motif on another right? and the reverse would have a, a winding floral design. Then there are dabbers that you can see the two bottom pictures in the center are of a dabber, then the skin rubber, all related to the social life of the people, the cultural life of the people. Next. These are some of the ceilings that we uh, found from uh, Oren. They have, most of them uh, came from the Shunga Kushan period onwards. So as I was saying, the Shunga Kushan period was basically the time when uh, the habitation reached its uh, zenith so far as the cultural uh, evolution goes. And it continued thereafter, next. Uh, some of the, how do we document or how do we uh, talk about, uh, when you are talking about the cultural or trying to remap the cultural uh, uh, story, tell the story. So what we did was try to collect botanical samples. How would you collect a botanical sample is that we would take up first dry sieving of the uh, deposit of the soil. Then we would process, we would wash it down with water. The second picture clockwise, if you see, that is where the that particular sample is being uh, churned into a water. Then that water is collected through a sieve. So what happens when you churn it into a water, the organic material, the burnt chard or anything, chard grains that you, they would come float up and the soil would settle down. So those floating water would be basically sieved. And then that, that sieve material is again poured through with clean water. Next. And then we try to identify in those gray, whether we are finding any charred grains or not. And each sample is then packed in muslin cloth left to dry. So these, uh, these, these are dried in shade and those, the boxes that you see there are of the paleobotanical samples that we could identify. Now, we identify that this is a particular grain that we are getting, but what kind of a grain it is, that would be identified by the scientists. So these are the samples that we have been prepared and these were sent to uh, BSIP Lucknow. Uh, and each of the packets that you see there would be uh, numbered and labeled when it was found, from which depth it was found, from which trench it was found, so that when we are reconstructing the story, we get the whole idea. Next. So these were some of the uh, th uh, grains that were identified, courtesy Anil Pokharia, BSIP, Lucknow. We have rice, we have wheat, we have uh, barley, horse gram, urad, khesari, lentil, field pea, cotton, linseed. Next. We also did the same thing with paleozoological samples. We get, uh, no, we got a lot of bone, uh, bone uh, samples, a lot of shell samples and everything. These were handed over to the Zoological Survey of India in uh, Kolkata, and they identified freshwater turtles, snails, then domesticated animals like cattle, buffalo, pig, deer, dog, horse, and interestingly, a bone of a crocodile too. Next. Then, as I said, the present village of Urain is also uh, a living, thriving, hai. and there we found evidence of pottery. How they do, f they are making pottery nowadays. So, so we documented that also. There are two, three methods that we and we found those methods and we tried to document it. So, this basically is an eth ethno-archaeological aspect of how things were done in the past also. There won't be much difference because as you can see from the tools in the last, the same dabber, the dabber shape is basically the same. I showed you a few pictures back, the photograph of two dabbers, and you can see the dabbers that they are using currently is also of the same shape. So this continuity of tradition is 
carrying on and this gives a better idea and this helps us in identifying and analyzing what the archaeological record tells us about the past gone cultures. Next. So this is uh, the inference, as I said, was, uh, I'll just run through it, that the, it was started as a very small rural village, and, it's, and it, the habitation started growing from the early historical time. When it comes to the Shunga period from the uh, centuries of the Christian era, it turns into a mercantile settlement, which is produced by, which is proved by the number of seal ceilings that we are getting, uh, the firing activities that, I, uh, that we got evidence of. Uh, next. And this uh, continued till the Gupta period, but there was a shift during the Pal period or the early medieval period. The character of the site changes from a mercantile to a completely religious uh, establishment. Because of, the, because of the patronage of Pal rulers, Uren during the early medieval period transformed as a Buddhist site of which the Uren Pahari where we found evidence of uh, stupas as well as the Uren village proper was basically a monastic settlement. So there is a change in, th there is a transformation in the character of the settlement of Uren. Next. Um, I think the same thing I'm saying here also. Next. That's it. Thank you. Hopefully I still good time. Thank you, Dr. Bhattacharya, for literally educating us on this very interesting site in Lucky Sarai, Uren. Uh, the, the, the historical canvas which you covered and the details of excavation, the archaeological uh, findings have been really fascinating to listen to. Thank you for the presentation. Our next speaker is Mr. Sajjad. Shahid. Mr. Shahid is a practical, practicing civil engineer with a keen interest in history, culture, art, and architecture. A dedicated heritage activist, he has contributed towards increasing awareness for the protection and preservation of built heritage. He has played an instrumental role in a number of conservation projects and has served on various committees as an expert on culture, heritage, and urban history. Mr. Shahid is a prolific writer, and his columns and articles are published regularly in the leading newspapers and journals. His lec he lectures extensively on heritage and culture to varied audiences. His core areas of interest are history and architecture of Hyderabad and the Deccan, and Dakni literature. Mr. Shahid. Most particularly, Professor uh, uh, Monty. Uh, I've been looking forward to meeting you. We'll interact with you later. Uh, till now, we have been talking about tangible heritage. Then you can touch, see, hear about. I'm going to take up the other side of heritage, which is intangible. Uh, a poet from these parts, I think he was from Bihar, a P.C. Srivastava, who had, he was a Takallus uh, Rin, he was a Urdu poet. He said, Noha kha hai mere mazi ke khandar in bastiyo mein kuch sutun baakhi hai abbi jin pe chadkar lamhe bolte hai. My ruins of my past lie scattered in these regions. There's still a few pillars left from atop of which my past 
talks with me, calls, calls me. So my oh, that is the aspect I'll be talking about. Dakhni uh, Tehzeeb, this is a culture of a particular region, a region which has uh, tried to assert its individuality, its uh, uniqueness, its, its being different, especially from the north of India. Uh, there's a long history of uh, there being a cultural divide, at least if not other types of divides in the, uh, the subcontinent as being north of or south of the Vindhyas and the Narvada. Uh, so I'm talking about south of the Narvada. And uh, beginning of the 14th century, we find a, a very conscious uh, attempt at creating you may even say fabricating a, a, a unique identity, cultural identity, of course. Political was the basis, I think, on which the cultural need for a cultural identity as arose. But there was this very conscious, very determined effort on part of the Deccan to create a unique identity for itself. The reason was the revolt of the uh, Sultanate grandees of the Deccan who decided to part ways from the Sultanate and in 1347 uh, elected one of their own to be the first Bahmani Emperor. Now elected, I have scored that because uh, that set a trend and created an atmosphere where uh, the Deccan Sultan had you know, various dynasty in various times uh, could be questioned, unlike northern India, where monarchs and rulers were absolute powers. Of course, there were exceptions to the rule in the Deccan too, but this is what it was all about there. So basically, it was a quest for a distinct identity, and that was maintained, despite the passage of time, despite different dynasties coming up, despite changes in the political order, that quest continued. Uh, it was a, a, a sustained quest over centuries. As I said, it started with uh, an attempt to legitimize the kingship of the Bahmanis, of the those who had revolted against the Dhani Sultanate. And that required an othering from the Sultanate itself, that we are not part of the Delhi Sultanate. So as a result of that, what happened is they had to create their, their own markers of identity. Now architecture, of course, they were borrowings and from the established styles that were there in the Deccan. Uh, dress, cuisine, these are things which you uh, know more than me about, I, I'm sure. And of course, art and architecture, um, Ratish has introduced the topic and Omang will take it further after me. So I'm talking about two of these very important indices, markers of our identity. One is language and the other is uh, spirituality. Uh, what happened in the Deccan is there emerged a language after this parting of space with, from Delhi, uh, which was called the Deccani language. And of course, the people who spoke that language are the Dakinis that I'm talking about. Of course, there they were a lot of locals also who uh, later on blended with that culture, created culture. Uh, and there was this emergence of a language. A language was a language of communication, lingua franca for the region. Uh, basically, a synthesis of uh, uh, Persian and <coughs> Sanskrit and other regional languages. Uh, the basic concept of uh, Dakini as uh, stated by one of the, its own poets is that rakhiya kam sanskrit me ke isme bol adhik bolne se rakhiya hu amol jise farsi ka na kuch gyan hai so dakhni zaba isko asan hai so ye hai ke I have kept sanskrit to a minimum in my language adhik bolne se rakhiya hu amol to prevent it from unnecessary verbosity I don't think I need to translate this. As Hindi people understand Dakhani, uh, uh, you know, better than uh, 
Urdu speakers. So, um, if those of you who know Hindi will understand. So, there was this balance between cohesion. There's a conscious effort at keeping uh, both in check and blending both at the same time to create a language. That is what the Hindi language is all about. And then, of course, the question of coalescence of mystic thought. Uh, mysticism, Islamic mysticism and bhakti uh, movements, their thoughts coming together and creating a, a new blend for both. Of course, both were impacted. So we have an entirely different type of Sufism that you find in the Deccan, which is very distinct from what was happening uh, in Sufi uh, evolution of Sufi practices and beliefs in North India. Then we have, uh, of course, developments in the Deccan. Uh, some of the key points, Feroz Shah, um, the ruler of uh, uh, Bermanis, he married the daughter of Devaraya, the king of Vijayanagara, and this brought about uh, uh, you know, a situation where uh, it was an opportunity to understand the other there in the Deccan and uh, to borrow, to synthesize, and of course, reach that ultimate objective of creating a culture, an edifice, which would be readily identifiable, uh, immediately apparent, uh, very distinct. So that is what it was all about. And then there was the shift of capital from Gulbarga to Bizar sometime uh, 1425, around 1425, after Feroz and his succession of his brother, Ahmed Shah. Now, Ahmed Shah is a person, uh, uh, even before that, you had a lot of mystics in the Deccan. You had Khaja Bandanas, Gesudaras coming from Delhi back to the Deccan, and uh, uh, that was a catalyst. And then there was this question of uh, the king himself, who was inclined towards mystic mysticism. And even today, people address him as either Shah Fakhir or Shah Dasta, depending on who uh, uh, the person is who is addressing the king. Uh, Hindus address him as uh, Shah Datta, an incarnation of the Tatriya, the local Lingayat cult. They have very high regard for him. So those practices are still on. So that is Ahmad Shavali, uh, Allama Prabhu, uh, an incarnation of the Tatriya. And then you have an old picture of the Veer Shava Mat, Lingayat chief, who travels even today. He comes in a, uh, you know, with, with a a uh, whole lot of his followers. Uh, last year, I believe it was uh, five to six hundred following him from Madhyal all the way from Madhyal to Gulbarga to take part in the annual Urs. Urs is the death centenary, and in Sufi traditions, death is a celebration because it's union with God. So there's this great celebration on, on all dargahs. Similarly, you have this great celebration of Urs at the Ahmad Shah Ali Darga, where you have the Lingayat. Uh, uh, priest of, of the Madhyal uh, Virashaya Mat coming in. That is an old picture, pre, pre independence. This is from 2020, one of the latest pictures that I could get. The tradition continues even today. You go there to Ahmad Shah Ali Bahmani's tomb in Asur near Bidar on any Amavas, and you will find the Aarti going on on the left side, and this uh, Malvi sitting and reciting the Quran on the right. And he, in the Urs, the, the Urs starts with uh, uh, the uh, Lingat pontiff changing his dress into that of a fakir, a mendicant, and receiving arms from the, the uh, mutawalli of the Darga now. That is how it starts, and only after he performs the arti, the host tradition control. Unfortunately, one of the few places, this was common all over the Deccan till about 30, 40 years back. Now it is one of the very few places that still retain those old traditions. Next, please. Of course, on the other side, uh, Dr. Kajab Ghani was uh, speaking about the two centers of Dakhani culture, one Golconda and one Bijapur. And this is what was happening on the other, other end. In Bijapur, you had uh, Ahmad Shah, uh, Ibrahim Adil Shah, also known as uh, uh, Jagat Guru. Uh, writing the Kitab and Oras, of course, most of you would have heard about Kitab and Oras. It is a treatise on music. Uh, he was a lover of music, revered as uh, Jagat Guru by his Hindu uh, fans, and uh, 
he was also very uh, well versed in uh, the local traditions, local culture, local uh, spirituality. Uh, of course, his famous work, Kitab and others, starts with an invocation to the whole Hindu pantheon, uh, Brahma, uh, Ganesh, Saraswati. Uh, this is, I think, one of the first lines you have. Narasur, Juga, Jyoti, Anisa, Rugani, Yusat, Saraswati, Mata, Ibrahim, Prakadat, Vahiduni, the translation I've given there. Uh, next, please. He also mentioned that very important thing, which was basis for Dakhni gaining such an importance there. Bhasha nyari nyari, bhava ek, kaha turk, kaha brahman. Be it a brahman or a turk, speaking different languages. Bhav is the same, emotions are the same, they don't change. Uh, of course, uh, he established a whole city called Naraspur, and for the past, I think, uh, there was an effort about 20 years back to restart what was called the Noros, uh, 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 Naraspur uh, festival, annual festival. I don't know whether it's still continuing or not. Next, please. Now, this Dakhni synthesis that came about was uh, the process of a long drawn uh, effort, you know, conscious effort, as I said. It was an osmotic process, slow absorption on both sides, sometimes here, sometimes there. Uh, there were interactions which led to exchanges and then borrowings from each other, uh, then an amalgamation into a manifestation which was apparent, which could be uh, seen, felt, uh, appreciated. So that is what really happened. So then, you know, you had this Dakhni identity coming into its own. It was uh, not just the architecture, you find that same thing, because you have commonalities in all uh, uh, cultural output of any partic particular period of a region has those commonalities. It is what is uh, embodied in architecture in music, in culture, in painting, in uh, crafts, will also be found in literature uh, and other social behavior and customs. So that is what I have tried to do. Uh, there was this conscious effort at creating a Dekni identity. Is it available in literature? I found a very interesting uh, series of uh, couplets from Qutub Mushtari, the famous uh, Masnavi of Qutub uh, Shahi court poet, Waji. Uh, the translation is there, the original is Dakan sa nahi thar sansar mein. It's uh, regarding the Deccan, I and mean, of course, by the time of Waji, even sub-regional identities are coming into play. That is what I wanted to point out. Dakan sa nahi thar sansar mein, punaj fazala ka hai this thar mein, Dakan hai nagina angoti hai jag, Angoti ko hurmat nagina hai lag. Dakan mulk ko ye ajab saaj hai ke sab mulk sar aur dakan taaj hai. Yaan tak to dakan ki baat ho rhi. We are talking about the dakan as a region and as a, its identity of the region that he is talking about. But then by that time, dakan had been divided as Dr. Kashavgani told you, to the east, west, uh, the Bahamanis uh, had split into five and then you had Golconda, you had Bijapur, you had Ahmednagar. So Golconda was also identified even in those days, days as Tilang because although the Golconda Empire spread right up to the coast, the heartland, uh, which the area which controlled that entire Qutub um, Shahi state was based in Telangana. Uh, so the final couplet is, you know, uh, assertion of a sub-regional identity as among, even among those Dakhnis who are great by themselves, Telangana is the greatest. And I think this is what eventually, this sentiment had been suppressed for a long time and only about 10, 12 years back, we finally saw it coming to its final uh, shape uh, by the creation of the state of Telangana. So finally he says, Dakhan khan dhan bhauti chhasa hai. Telangana is Telangana is the essence of the Deccan. So even within the Deccan, there is an assertion. Now, what was happening? How was this synthesis, this uh, cross-cultural 
exchanges, how are they impacting and how is it affecting society? There are quite a lot of manifestations. I said, first I told you already about the tomb of Ahmad Shavali. There are a lot of tombs all over uh, the Deccan where this thing is such things are practiced. But one of the most interesting features, one of the most interesting activities that happened in the Deccan is during the time of Muharram, the month of mourning, and of course, the first 10 days of mourning for the martyrs of Karbala. That is the Muharram. This is the Muharram procession in the city of Hyderabad. It dates, uh, its origin dates from the Qutub Shahi times, uh, except for the person sitting on the elephant, you know, that is the hereditary Mutawalli who is in charge, and the alam is the big alam which has been, uh, you know, present, uh, taken out in procession each year, every year since the Qutub Shahi times. All the other pulses around them, of course, this crowd here you cannot see, but those on the left and right carrying the standards, Mahi Marathi, all of them are Hindu families who have been doing it from the times of the Qutub Shahi. They do it also, they, they consider it a matter of pride. It is now uh, expanded into 12 families, Hindu families of Hyderabad, who have the honor of carrying the umbrella, the parasol, uh, and the standards of the martyrs of Karbala and the procession. Next. And of course, all over Telangana, of course it also happens in Karnataka and um, Andhra Pradesh, but most majorly in Telangana, Pirla Panduga, that is the 10th of Muharram, the 10th days of Muharram, is a very important occasion. Uh, everyone vanishes, all the, all the labor and migrant workers who come to the city, you have sudden a uh, shortage of manpower in Hyderabad as everyone goes back to their own uh, village, Ashur Khanas, and for the observation of these 10 days of Mohoram, and this is uh, Mohoram being celebrated in a village of Telangana. Next, please. Uh, the coalescence of mystic thought. You know, exchanges without there being a resultant uh, were meaningless, I, I would think. Uh, so what, what came out of it? The first thing that came out is long before the modern concept of Sapka Malik Eka, we have Shatura somewhere in the 16th, uh, uh, late 16th, early 17th, 17th century saying, Charmi yani shahud hai, aitebare hasta haan, lachman kahi kahlata, kahi ram kahi kahi rahim. So, in the flesh, uh, um, bearing witness of his ex existence and giving proof of his existence, he appears at places as Lashman, other, other places as Ram or Rahim. So that concept of Vahidatul uh, Jood, God being, or Vahidatul Shahud, everything bearing witness to the existence of God or everything uh, being a part of God, you know, unity of being, that had come in there. And uh, you have these Muharram rituals in Bijapur, as I said, the rituals are there all over the... One of the important things that came out in Bijapur was this family, the family of three Sufis there, uh, Miraji Shamsulush Shah, Buranuddin Janam, and Aminuddin Allah. Uh, they have written a lot, and from them started this concept of a, a, a change in how uh, uh, mystics, Sufis, attempted ex explaining matter, explaining life, ex explaining existence. Uh, Panch Tattva is a very common concept in uh, Hindu mythology, but uh, the West, of course, earlier had that, and Islam also based on only five things, four things. They didn't believe in the concept of Shunya, of there being nothing. So it was uh, Abu Atish, Badupa, uh, Khak, that is fire and water, uh, air and earth. These are the four elements from which everything is made and they dissolved into four, these four things. So this concept of Shunya, which was a purely Indian Hindu concept, uh, mystic concept, was borrowed by uh, Sufi mystics of the Deccan. And this Aminuddin's family was the first. There have been debates, but there have been no challenge to that original theory that uh, it was the family of Aminuddin Allah. Of course, started with Miraji Buranuddin Janam, but uh, culminated in Aminuddin Allah. 
विच ब्रॉड द फिलासफी ऑफ पाँच अनासर पच्चीस गुण फाइव एलिमेंट्स एंड ट्वेंटी फाइव एट्रीब्यूट इन टू यूज इन द एक्सप्लेनेशन ऑफ मिस्टिसम इस्लामिक मिस्टिसम सो दैट वॉज वन ऑफ द मेजर इम्पैक्ट सेकेंड मेजर इम्पैक्ट वॉज द इम्पैक्ट ऑफ किशन भक्ति ट्रेडिशन वेयर द लॉर्ड इज द सुप्रीम बिलवर्ड Uh, and uh, every devotee uh, expresses devotion in the vo feminine voice this also uh, concept came from came into uh, sufi thought and you have a lot of poetry uh, of course later on it would also transform into poetry which was non uh, spiritual in nature it would impact that too but uh, that was it and this uh, concept of unity of being you know you find it uh, in uh, All over the Deccan in those period, Allama Prabhu, after whom the Ahmed Shah Ali is called Allama Prabhu, uh, the, the reincarnation, uh, himself said, with uh, mind given rest from its usual toil, for him who has merged his own self with the Lord, all, all thoughts of attainment, his knowledge be spoiled for himself, into self having joined with great Tio, for him there is no dual, no unity broke. O Lord of the caves. Now, this exactly same thing is being stated by Khaja Bandhan Wazir, Yusuf Zara Wazir. And I have highlighted the two lines which are almost identical. For him who has merged his own self with the Lord. Of course, yeah, the lower one, Khaja Bandhan Wazir, he said that in Dakhni. It's very beautiful. He said, "I'll while you read that, I'll recite that." Pani me namak dal, basa dekhna usse. जब घुल गया नमक तो नमक बोलना किसे दिस इज अबाउट एनिलियशन ऑफ द सेल्फ ऑफ योर एगो योर पर्सनैलिटी एंड मर्जिंग इट विद दैट ऑफ द क्रिएटर बिकॉज यू आर वन सो आफ्टर दैट दज नथिंग रिमेन्स दैट तो पानी में नमक डाल बसा देखना उसे जब घुल गया नमक तो नमक बोलना किसे यूँ खोए खुदी अपनी खुदा साथ मुस्तफ़ा जब घुल गई खुदी तो खुदा बिन न कोई जिसे नथिंग रिमेन्स एक्सेप्ट गॉड and that's almost i think exactly identical to what allama prabhu is saying for him there is no dual no unity broke next point. continuing that it continued you know this this concept kept on being repeated by succeeding uh, sufis and mystics of the deccan uh, like the concept of uh, omnipresence of uh, uh, the creator of god अहे रूप तेरा रत्ती रत्ती है पर्वत पर्वत पत्ती पत्ती है पत्ती में पर्वत में अधिक न कम पत्ती में एक सा बसे रास और रत्ती में आई गिवन द ट्रांसलेशन योर इमेज मैनिफेस्ट इन एवरीथिंग फ्रॉम द माइटीएस्ट माउंटेन टू द टाइनिएस्ट पेटल नेक्स्ट प्लीज दिस कंटिन्यूड दिस इज Uh, you know hyderabad state old hyderabad state and the standard uh, uh, the state of the nizam there were a lot of small states who were uh, independent in a lot of lot of ways and these were rajwadas uh, mostly and they were called the samasthans they were old uh, feudal lords of that region who had been in power since kakatiyan times even now they are in power they still own the properties gadwal vanparti jatparol these are the major samasthans of hyderabad state who were over diligence to the nizam but were fairly independent rulers and this is one of the rulers of uh, such a state this is a person who has nothing to do with north india his ancestors have been in the deccan for a thousand years he is a telugu bidda that is what we call him his ancestors were all telugus suddenly he devel develops a love for urdu poetry and persian poetry he is uh, the author of 60 books at last count and, and i'm still counting 60 books in persian arabic uh, urdu uh, raja rajeshwar rao he was also a poet himself he used the takhallus and nam diploma of uh, azgar azgar manzil his house is still there in domakonda fort in nizamal district and this is his uh, uh, very sufi uh, po ghazal which i i could find because his descendants wanted 
they are having a, they have an annual festival and i think uh, 10th that is day after uh, day after or tomorrow tomorrow they are having the dongkonda uh, urdu festival so those traditions are still continuing and one of the kawwal will be singing this poem there at dongkonda uh, tomorrow next uh this concept of addressing god by all names allah by all names by muslims is very old as i told you the family of burhan din janam and aminuddin ala burhan din was the first to uh, where i encountered in dakni a clear statement which says you you to sham salona tu mera re na chale tujh par mastar lo na le this is a, again talking about fana but he says ke he addresses allah as sham there and then you have uh, khadi mahmud bahri one of my own ancestors uh, stating in 1670 as lal hai mehndi ka rang about the real and apparent when you see something it might appear to be something but then actually the real part that is hidden behind that image is something entirely else wo explain karte hue said ke lal hai mehndi ka rang nahi ye hari hai na when you take it as a leaf it is green when you make a paste it is green when you apply it's green but when you a bit of what it leaves behind is red so he said actually the color of henna is red not green not the henna plant you hai hari ram ki karigari so here uh, mahmud bhari has addressed allah as hari ram uh, and shah turab of course he, here you find you know whole terminology of uh, uh, bhakti uh, uh, poetry coming in अल्लाह कहो सो ओम कहो या राम या रहमान कहो दर हर जबान हर नाम का सिमरन सुनकर हर हर बार करो रे रियाजत रफ पर राजी रहना रात और देर रात और दिन राम रहीम रहमान है एक ही सदगुरु का उपदेश सदगुरु हियर इंसिडेंटली इज नॉट द प्रेजेंट सदगुरु ये सोलो टैक्स टॉक्स ऑल सर्ट ऑफ थिंग बट दिस सदगुरु इज अमीनुद्दीन आला because uh shaturav was uh, a, a disciple of uh, aminuddin's descendant uh, of course abdul khadir siddiqui hazrat even today if you go to hyderabad to at darga you are most likely to come across the khawal singing uh, at least a few of his compositions abdul khadir siddiqui was the first uh, founding uh, professor of the department of theology and uh, Uh, religious studies in the Usmania University when it was founded in uh, first, and he continued to be there till he retired in the 1930s. I think he was a very highly revered Sufi saint. Uh, his poetry is sung on all uh, in all dargahs of Hyderabad, and uh, one of his compositions is the Thumri Sunle Arajmuri Ram Re Sud Visra Gayo Ram Re Tirchi Najariya Se Mari Kateriya Le Gayo Sukha Ram Re. so this is a, you know not not a ordinary sufi which is these days says are ye to isi qisam ki baatein karte hain but this was a professor of theology uh, of islamic studies who is talking in this way and he's saying that uh, allah is he's addressing as ram and jam so ye this is what was achieved in hyderabad in the deccan and then hyderabad of course uh, you find a lot of native associations hyderabad की शायरी और उससे पहले दगन की शायरी में यू लेर फाइंड इमेजरी विच इज फॉरन दखनी पोइट्स वेरी रेयरली टॉक अबाउट शीरी फराद लैला मजनू दे ऑलवेज टॉक अबाउट राम सीता और uh, हमारे जो लोकल आपके यहाँ के लव स्टोरीज हैं दे टॉक अबाउट दैट दे टॉक अबाउट लोकल फ्लोरा एंड फोना मोर की बात करेंगे हिरन की बात करेंगे वो चचा गालिब की तरह वो क्या कहेंगे शीरी फराज और लाल गुल की बात नहीं करते दे टॉक अबाउट लोकल फ्लावर्स लोकल फ्लोर एंड फोना नेक्स्ट प्लीज वेल वील मूव ऑन दिस इज री इंटरप्रेटिंग ऑफ द आइकन्स दैट वर फाउंड यू हैव दिस गज सिमा मोटिव वेरी कॉमन इन टेम्पल्स स्पेशली इन ओरिसा साइड and you have the same in darga of uh, gesu daras upper in the spandrel and then you have uh, uh, next please 
synthesis and architecture. I said I will not talk about talk about it. Just I'll show you two instances where you have uh, architecture uh, synthesizing the different uh, styles, uh, the Islamic style, which was imported by the Sultanate and the, the successors and the local style. Next, please. Same same thing in the Sitaram Bagh temple. You have Islamic and uh, Mughal uh, Rajput design coming in with the a local temple architecture of the Deccan. Next, please. Of course, you have uh, the great uh, discovery of uh, Ajanta and Alora and the Nizam's government spending all its resources on the restoration of Ajanta and Alora. Uh, people have forgotten all about it now, but uh, for me, it was a great loss because everything that was done there by the government of Hyderabad has been uh, Ignored, no one acknowledges the contributions of the Hyderabad government or of Yazdani. Uh, but then we spent so much there that we neglected our own architectural ma masterpieces, which were now being, thanks to Mr. Ratish Nanda, are being restored now. All our resources were spent there. Uh, well, that is what Dakni culture is all about. It's a synthesis of cultures. It's, uh, the language is a synthesis of Sanskrit and uh, Persian, but then being fully conscious of not letting either of the languages get the upper hand. It was the language of the masses, which was made, which was elevated to such a degree that it became the language of literature. Nowhere else you had uh, the language of the common man, the language of the times, acquiring the status of a literary language, a, a language fit for literary expression. It took a, a, a Wali Dakani to come from the Deccan, from Aurangabad to Delhi, and tell the people of Delhi that this is also a language in which you can write. Only after that you have Delhi starting to speak, starting to express themselves in Urdu. Urdu uh, owes a lot to Wali, but that's a different story. So, what is everyone uh, is now uh, thinking about the Deccan in some way or the other. They've always been doing that. Uh, Zubair Azvi, a poet of uh, Delhi, whose family had for a time migrated to uh, the Deccan, uh, says this about the allure of the Deccan. Kahat Musafir Uttar ka jo shahron shahron ghuma Dilli dekhi, Bombay dekhi, Kalkatta bhi dekha Bindhiya chal ki god mein lekin Dakkan shahar hai aisa Jo aya ek baar yahan so that is the allure of the Deccan. I'm sure you know a lot of people who have migrated from all over the world, all over the India, to the Deccan and to Hyderabad and have stayed there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sajad Shahid, for taking us deep into the very rich tapestry of intangible heritage in the Deccan through the nuances of language, culture, shared traditions, and mystical practices. Our next and final speaker is Umang Kochar, who is currently a research assistant with the AKTC as part of the Qutub Shahi Heritage Park project in Hyderabad. Umang specializes in early modern South Asia between 1500 and 1800 and has a keen interest in the history of the Deccan Sultanates. He is interested in the study of the Indian Ocean world with a focus on merchant mobilities, art, cosmopolitan societies, and Colombian exchange. Umang is, is, is a research consultant to the South Asian Studies Unit at the Institute of Ismaili Studies, London. Umang is our former student and did his master's from historical studies here before moving on for a second master's in Muslim cultures from the Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations, Aga Khan University, London. Over to Umang. Hello everyone, uh, thank you 
to my seniors uh, Sajad Saab, Ratish Nanda for introducing uh, everyone and enlightening us about the Deccan, about the conservation. I thank uh, Dr. Kashyap for introducing me to the Deccan first on, uh, during our lectures at Nalanda. Uh, uh, also, thank you for having us here. Uh, so I work with the AKTC as a research assistant and uh, uh, I came to Hyderabad uh, in 2021 July. So when I came to Hyderabad, I had, I haven't had a single visit to the city of Hyderabad and uh, soon I was going to be part of a very prestigious project and uh, I got into this a uh, project about the Qutub Shahi history, so I had to document all the uh, objects related to the, uh, and I have to gather uh, archives related to the Qutub Shahis for the AKDC. So in this presentation, what I would be trying is that I would be giving you an overview of uh, the Deccan, the Qutub Shahis, bit of about Golconda, what purpose Golconda does have, then the Hyderabad, the city of Hyderabad, and what similarities it has with the city of erstwhile uh, Kakadiya city of Warangal. And uh, I would be showcasing a bit of the objects I have documented at the State Museum Hyderabad. And uh, uh, I'll also brief about the Qutub Shahi Sultans a bit and uh, what sort of character they had and uh, what sort of, you know, things they commissioned. Yeah, first slide, slide please. So yeah, this is a bit of timeline to put this into the context. Uh, to understand in this, this in the particular context of Golconda, we will start with, uh, we have the Delhi Sultanate coming into the Deccan. Sajjad Sahib has already briefed about it. Uh, apart from that, then I will start with the 1518 one because that is the year which formally marks the uh, breakaway from the larger Behmani world to the Qutub Shahi independent kingdom now. Uh, so the Qutub Shahi is in uh, uh, one way you can say are not uh, really like the other Deccani Sultanates. So Qutub Shahis have a past which already goes back to Iran and they were the rulers there. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite extraordinary story. We have a story of uh, Babur who is wandering during the same time looking for a kingdom. But we also have a king in Deccan which is also doing sort of a similar thing. So, uh, so he comes from the city of uh, present day Hamadan in the north uh, let's say uh, north western region of uh, Iran. Uh, so this guy Sultan Kuli Kutabul Mulk. Uh, earlier, his it, his name is only Sultan Kuli Kutabul Mulk is the title given by the Bahamanis, which is like governor for uh, the Bahamani Sultanate. So uh, when he arrived in Golconda, so before that he spent couple of years at. Uh, the second capital of the Bahamanis, which was Bidar. So he spent quite a while there. So first he became Khwas Khan, then slowly elevated as, you know, uh, Kutubul Mulk. So when he came down to Golconda, uh, uh, he fought many wars, but his is the one, uh, you can say regarded as one of the longest reigning sultans and then it comes Abdullah much later. So Sultan Kuli arrived in Golconda and uh, declared his capital formally uh, around 1518. And then finally in 1543 he lost uh, life to his uh, one of his very uh, ambitious sons. So he's believed that he was assassinated uh, we don't really have exact proof for that, but it's one of the popular stories you have to rely on. 
so in 1543, Jamshed hired an assassin and uh, Sultan Kuli was murdered in the masjid, uh, which is right opposite to the Bala Hisar fort inside the Golconda. So uh, he was murdered and then finally Jamshed Qutub Shah becomes the second Sultan. And then finally he uh, was uh, took over by his son Subhan Kuli, but he was uh, because Jamshed. And then uh, in around 1550, Ibrahim Kuli, who took a refuge at Vijayanagara, the Hindu kingdom there in the Deccan. So he stayed there for seven years and finally came back around 1550s. And uh, you can say he's one guy who actually consolidated the Qutb Shahi Sultanate and patronized most of the work as you see now. And uh, he's the one who gave, uh, Ratish gave the presentation about the Qutb Shahi tombs and one of the things he did was he that he gave one of the original entrances to the Qutb Shahi tombs, which is which was the formal entrance connecting the Qutb Shahi tombs and the Golconda fort. By the way, that also we excavated during the uh, 2016. Uh, one of our uh, 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 during the conservation and and how we figured it out, we looked at the archival image, and that's how we got to know that this gateway still exists. And when we started uh, looking for that, it was there. And from that point, the Golconda is just 300 meters away. So it's a, it's, it's a, uh, Qutb Shahi tombs become an ensemble. I'll, I'll, I'll show you that in one of the pictures. Uh, yeah, so uh, after uh, Ibrahim, the one major shift which comes into the Golconda's history is uh, Battle of Tali Talikota. So Battle of Talikota is all the Deccan allied forces fighting against Vijayanagara. And that is the year which shifted the entire, you can say, the course of uh, Deccani history. Uh, and then uh, now we are into the urbanization phase of the Golconda or the Hyderabad Sultanate. So in 1578, he finally constructs a, a Purana Pul, which is one of the earliest structures in in uh, Hyderabad. People say that it's Charvanar, but things are way before that period as well. For example, Purana Pula is one, then you also have Mola Ali Shrine, and uh, you also have Hussain Sagar. So that's three which predates Charvanar as well. So apart from that, uh, then Muhammad uh, Kuli Kutub Shah is, uh, is a guy who takes over the throne in 1580s. He takes over as the fourth, fifth sultan of the Qutb Shahis. Uh, he is uh, usually known as uh, the flamboyant, the, the uh, you can say the poet, uh, the builder, and uh, who is the one who actually gave a lot of time to the art and architecture uh, of, the, of the Golconda Sultanate. And then you have the 1591 completion of 1000 Hijri of Islamic year calendar. And that is the year when Hyderabad's is formally uh, uh, comes into being. Uh, Charminar is the first structure to be built, and then followed by Bachai Shurkhana and a uh, couple of structures uh, like Darul Shifa, all, all uh, in a close proximity. And then uh, you have uh, Makkah Masjid, one of the major monumental sites in Hyderabad, very close to Charminar, built because the Jama Masjid built earlier close to the uh, Charminar was not enough to accommodate all the people coming there for the Jumma Namaz. And then you have uh, 1626 because Muhammad Qutb Shah died very young and uh, his son takes over the throne, Abdullah Qutb Shah, and Hayat Baksh Begum becomes the regent queen. So Deccan is also very famous for her very strong feminist uh, queens of that period. So like you have figures like, you know, uh, Chand Bibi, you have figure like, figures like Hunza Humayun, then you have figures like Hayat Baksh Begum. So these are like very important uh, women figures in the Deccani history. So I forgot to mention 1636 because that is the year when Abdullah actually uh, signs the deed of submission to the Mughals and uh, Golconda 
formally, in formal sense, Golconda becomes the Mughal protectorate. So Golconda start minting the coins in the name of the uh, Mughals. So first it's Shah Jahan and then it's later it's Aurangzeb. So all the gold coin and the silver coins are minted in the name of the Mughals. Uh, Qutb Shahis, they did not mint their own coins. They only minted copper coins for themselves. They used the Vijayanagara Hun, which was already in circulation. And uh, apart from that, uh, 1656 is the period when we see the first attack of Golconda by the Mughals. And that is the year which, you know, has one of the famous stories attached to Golconda, that is Kohinoor. There are three versions of Kohinoor. Still, uh, I'm working on that thing. But uh, this is one of the stories I have been quoting the most, that Gol uh, Kohinoor was ha handed over by uh, um, Mir Jumla Muhammad Said to the Shah Jahan, and then finally, you know the rest. And then uh, uh, Shah Jahan uh, sends Aurangzeb and uh, Golconda's siege uh, happens, and uh, Abdullah has to give one of his daughters to uh, Prince uh, Muhammad Sultan, one of sons of Aurangzeb, with the promise that the Golconda Sultanate would eventually pass on to the Mughals, because Abdullah had no female, uh, uh, no male heirs. He had uh, three daughters. So yeah, and uh, that is the period when we see the construction of Naya Kela, an extension of the older Golconda, and Naya Kela now is a uh, golf ground, by the way. And then, uh, 1672, Abdullah is succeeded by his son-in-law, Abul Hassan Qutb Shah. He had very three strong candidates. Abdullah, uh, Abdullah had uh, very three strong candidates at his court. So Abul Hassan, one of being supported by the Sufis and several courtiers, became the Sultan at the end. And then, 1687 is the period when you have the second siege of Golconda, which roughly lasted around uh, the eight months, and uh, that is the period when we see the end of the Qutb Shahi Sultanate, and finally Abul Hassan being taken as a captive by the Aurangzeb. He died around 1699, and uh, he's the only guy who is not buried in the Qutb Shahi tombs. Other, apart from that, we have all the Qutb Shahi Sultans buried at single place in the Qutb Shahi tombs. So that's very interesting. That's, that is one thing which makes our project more interesting because you won't find a site like this in the entire world where you have all the sultans or all the rulers buried in the same necropolis. Because like the Mughals, you have different places. You have Agra, you have uh, Delhi, so all these different places. But for the Qutb Shahis, except the last, all are there. Uh, next, please. So to put Deccan in context, and particularly the Qutb Shahis, this is roughly the area the Qutb Shahis ruled. Uh, if you closely look at it, uh, uh, before the formation of Telangana, this is how the Andhra Pradesh also looked. So technically, you can say, uh, all the Telugu lands are covered in this map. But one interesting thing is that they had a stretch until Madras, which is very interesting, because Madras was a later town developed by the British. Uh, so yeah, one of uh, the Qutb Shahis uh, uh, envisioned, uh, he's quite literally left in the history. Not many historians you know, quote him that much, Abdullah Qutb Shah. Uh, usually considered as that, uh, you know, Abdullah is the one who, whose period is, you know, the ki kind of a, uh, a downfall for the Qutb Shahi kingdom. But actually that is also on the fun side that that is also the period when Qutb Shahi had the most expansion. And that is towards the down south. And that is the period when you see most of uh, the diamond trade being in institutionalized in a proper manner. And you have uh, trade ties with the sultanates like Aceh in, uh, in, in Southeast Asia. And that is the period on its peak as well. So on one side, you have Abdullah signing this deed of submission to the Mughals. But on the other side, he's, he's uh, expanding further down south. 
next slide next slide please so these are the two uh, uh, good findings we had uh, these the, these are uh, the maps of uh, golconda and hyderabad uh the, these are done in a manuscript uh, by tajalli ali shah uh, nizam uh, courtier uh, in the 18th century so if you closely look at it uh, you can find charminar in the center of this you can also have a look at uh, nizam ali khan one of the nizams uh, uh, being sitting at the top both the places uh in balasaher as well in chomalla palace as well and uh, then you have uh, a french guy over there very close to him until that point french were very close to the nizams and then uh, you can also spot here if you closely have a look you can all, all mark all the qutub shahi structures until 18th century which were like you know the all the important ones and on this left one you have uh, the nau mahal uh of the qutub shahis you also have the bala isar nizam sitting there but you also have the qutub shahi tombs there on the right corner if you look closely you have all the qutub shahi tombs and you have the dargah of husain shah wali so that is very interesting and that is i personally believe uh, that one of the reasons why hyderabad is still call it seven tombs is that you have uh, a very strong tradition in the in the nizam period which stuck to the seven tombs tradition and in this picture you can uh, count it that there are seven tombs and followed by the husain shah wali tomb on a very uh, end of the corner uh, next please so this is how the golconda and the qutub shahi tombs would have looked in the end of the 18th century uh, you see uh, they are quite close uh, Uh, you can see the balai sar in this uh, painting you can see all the qutub shahi tombs this is if you uh, want to situate this this painting in a uh, contemporary perspective this is a, is the area if you look from a banjara hills top view this is how this might look this is that side of golconda next please nowadays how it looks uh, this is how qutub shahi tombs and golconda are that is the tomb of uh, mohammad qutub shah in the center you have uh, the founder of the golconda dynasty sultan quli qutub shah then you have jamshed on the extreme then you also have ibrahim so that is like you know the earliest part of the uh, one of the earliest part we also have uh, the archaeological space which we are still dating it and probably it dates 500 or 600 years back but uh, this is the core of the qutub shahi tombs uh, next please so uh, while one of my work is to document the material objects at the uh, aga khan trust for culture but also i have to research and put them into the context and that's what uh, i have been doing so if you just uh give a quick read on this that uh, this is by a 17th century european traveler who is visiting the cities of you know hyderabad and golconda and how the how he is finding these cities so i had myself carried in a planko and disguised as a persian merchant sometimes to golconda and other times to bagnagar so that is also one of the interesting debates nowadays but bag here literally means uh, as in bhagya or uh, as in auspicious because hyderabad and also bhagya uh, bag is uh, is the persian word bag which is the garden so hyderabad is literally called the city of gardens as well uh, these are two powerful opulent towns half league he has written 2.45 kilometers but in real if you start from charminar and towards golconda that's roughly about 11 kilometers to charminar to golconda distance is around 11 kilometers from one another and the capital of this rich kingdom of golconda uh, the first which give uh, which gives its name to the kingdom so basically what he is trying to do is that he is trying to explain how the golconda looks how golconda is and what sort of you know structures are there how golconda is situated in that uh, so it's it's very interesting for us to have that sort of information when we are putting conservation to context as well so that is why i keep collecting these things that's 
that's one of my jobs to do uh, to do on the project next please so this is uh, uh, the 1917 drawing, five drawing of uh, the Golconda fort. So if you look uh, at the center, that is the core uh, area of the fort, which is like you know open to the public, where you can go and uh, click all the pictures. That is all the fancy stuff happens. But apart from that, Golconda is quite a big fort. It's huge. If you start, you know, running around that fort, start driving around, it's uh, it's very tough to uh, cover the entire thing at length. Uh, Golconda, uh, to put Golconda particularly in context, the Golconda's work commenced in, uh, I mean, the uh, research work about Golconda started around the 19th century in proper sense by the British uh, colonial officials. 20th century is the uh, period when you see a lot of uh, work being done on about Golconda because that's when the Nizam archaeology is formed. And that is where I work the most at the Nizam's uh, archaeological museum, which is now the state museum. Uh, so most of the documents I've been collecting uh, uh, around the Golconda, these are all earlier collected by the uh, Nizam officials, those archaeologists there. So in the center you have Golconda, the Bala Hisar, all these uh, places. Around that you have in total eight uh, gateways, which are Bodli Darwaza, Makkah Darwaza, and uh, Patancheru. Patancheru is the closest to the Qutub Shahi tombs. Then you have Banjara Darwaza. So all these Darwazas. Uh, the interesting part is that some of the area is still under the army occupation because uh, that is the area which has been traditionally there since uh, the army was sent uh, for the Nizam forces. Then army has since then took over that place. So that is inaccessible to us. Uh, then you have on the top, you have the Naya Kila being constructed around 1656. And that is the area where uh, recent excavations found a bag as well, a char bag. And then you also have a uh, couple of structures dating to the 16th century as well. Although the construction of the walling of that fort is around 17th century, mid of 17th century, but you have structures dating to 16th century as well. And that to Ibrahim Kuli Kutub Shah's period. Next, please. So uh, I tried collecting few, uh, so it's, it's, it's tough to get uh, Golconda's, uh, you know, first-hand primary sources, information about uh, how Golconda might have looked like in the 16th century. We, what, whatever we have, most of the times it's from the 17th century. So while we were working at the archives there uh, in Hyderabad, so we came across a uh, manuscript, Tazkiratul Mulk, and Tazkiratul Mulk mentions uh, the Golconda at length. Uh, it's written by uh, Adil Shahi, uh, court historian, uh, Rafil Din Shirazi, who happens to visit Golconda uh, to meet uh, Ibrahim, and uh, that's what he writes about. One of my favorite uh, things is that Golconda had a special dedicated space for uh, the history writers, you know, where you can have debates, uh, you can uh, ha read manuscripts. That's one of my favorite uh, take from this thing. And then you also have, uh, apart from that, you also have uh, Golconda being one of the major or the most prominent uh, diamond uh, places producing places, uh, Golconda's, uh, most of the diamond merchants and polishers were placed in the Golconda fort premises. Next, please. So story of many Golconda, Sajad Saab usually introduces Golconda and his hunt for Golconda's to finding many Golconda's is, is very interesting. Uh, if you want to have this like discussion more, please shoot him questions that he would be happy to answer. But yeah, Golconda uh, is basically a word 
Gola plus Konda. Mm. Gola is uh, basically a shepherd king or the shepherd fort. Uh, it's a Telugu word. And then uh, Golconda as a name left a deep uh, imagination in the Orient, uh, in, in, in the in the Western world. So uh, if you Google or if you you know look at the Oxford Dictionary uh, and type Golconda, you would find its associations with uh, something like rich uh, and opulent or something like you know uh, very 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 wealthy. So that idea of Golconda being attached to diamonds has somehow stuck in history and that is being still used and uh, that is one of the things that uh, Kashif Ghani handed over me a booklet last last night and uh, that was about Golconda in fact. So the story of many Golcondas is, is still a quest. So you have many Golcondas, you have Golcondas in Americas, there are three Golcondas in the Americas. Recently found, we found a Golconda street in Canada, we have Golconda mines in Brazil, which were later mines because Golconda was one of the only places until the 18th century which produced that large number of diamonds. So all the major diamonds you can think of be, being Kohinoor or uh, the blue diamond or all the diamond or the hope, whatever you can think of, all came from Golconda's mine. Uh, by Golconda I mean the Deccan and Golconda being one of the most prominent ones. So uh, apart from that, uh, you also have Golconda's long tradition in depicting the region's mine. Golconda as a name attached in the 17th century, but those mines were already famous. So even Marco Polo uh, wrote about it. So even if you like, you know, look and read about the Ottomans' imagination of the Golconda's uh, or the Deccan's, uh, uh, how they, they viewed those diamond mines. There is one story which has sort of stuck to uh, this, this literary world and has been handed over to the generations. So until uh, Tavernier comes to the Golconda mines, he basically introduces a newer version. Otherwise there was a story that uh, a piece of meat is, meat is thrown in the valleys and the eagles there would collect that meat and with that the diamonds would get stuck and that's how they would take the diamonds out. So that was one of the stories being narrated in many literary traditions. Next please. So uh, talking about Golconda Fort, uh, so that uh, the, the left side you see the Golconda's uh, uh, diamond bazaar still exists. You have to snuggle around your way and uh, find it in the streets. Uh, the entrance is still there, but uh, there's a mosque heavily encroached, modified a lot. So you, you can't really make a sense about what this mosque would have been, but uh, you can only guess that this is a Qutb Shahi mosque looking at the minarets of that mosque. Then this is how the moat looks Golconda has one of the uh, one of the big moats in the Deccani forts, so s some of it still survives. That is how it looks. So that's how I've already talked about uh, the these these significance and the these these images on the Golconda fort. Yali you would find in most of the Deccani forts. Yali I found in the sword as well which was very interesting while documenting the swords at the State Museum. And this is a narrative showcasing Tuti Name, which is earlier version of a Sanskrit uh, literature then translated finally into the, you know, uh, Farsi. You also have a similar tradition in the Malay world known from the Budiman. So, so this is a widely circulated story in the, in the Indian Ocean world. Next please. So coming now to the Hyderabad, uh, so m most of the people when they talk about Hyderabad, they talk about biryani, they talk about Haleem, they talk about the Nizams. They think that Hyderabad is something, you know, which is very recent, Nizams built it and all the Nizams 
uh, are being still credited for many of the times. So most of the times. So if you uh, have a quick read, Hyderabad is basically interpreted as I said, as I said, uh, Asaf Sai Nizam city. But uh, in real, Hyderabad was founded by the Qutub Shahis uh, as, as, as a pleasure place as to have something, an unwalled space, uh, which was very common in Deccan, by the way. Deccan had many unwalled cities, like Ahmednagara being one of them, Khidki being one of them. So Hyderabad was one of those lines only. And uh, these are the structures uh, uh, were built by Muhammad Kuli, uh, the sixth, sul uh, fifth Sultan of the Qutb Shahis. And the kind of population who, which lived there, Persians, Dakhanis, Ar Armenians. Armenians is one of the understudied uh, merchant communities in Hyderabad because you also have a very good grave site for the, uh, for the Armenians there. So Armenians had a very strong association with the Hyderabad, and, but yet they remained one of the understudied areas. You have Europeans, European includes Portuguese, Dutch. Dutch had one of the stronger presence uh, until the 17th century. Then you have the British. Finally, later, French and the Danes also come into the picture. Mm -hmm. East Africans were very big in number in Deccan. And you have many, many good examples of the uh, East Africans being in the high court surface. And then you have the Caucasians or the present-day Georgia. Armenia, this region, people from this region, they were very strong at the Qutb Shahi court and they, they, they came as uh, mercenaries most of the time. So again, like I introduced you to one of the 17th century uh, writings about Golconda, this is about Hyderabad. So here, the, uh, this is from uh, Tavernier's writings, one of the uh, very famous travelers, European travelers. So his, his writing is very interesting because here he compares the city of Hyderabad uh, to Louvre, uh, the, the pull, uh, Narva pull to the Louvre at Paris. And, uh, and, and uh, interesting that he also says, goes on to say that Hyderabad is you know, you know, better than uh, uh, Paris in many, in, in, in uh, in a broader sense, and uh, he talks about the fruits, he talks about how the, the, the city of garden is, and uh, how they keep it clean. So his, his account is one of the, you know, very rich accounts, which gives you quite nice details about the, how Qutb Shahis would have functioned during that time. But also that comes with the caution that uh, some of the things you can't really take them as the face value because some of them could have been hearsay as well, the way he has reported in his writings. Next, please. And then you have the location for Hyderabad, why Hyderabad was actually built. So around the 1570s uh, when the trade finally was, you know, uh, opened up, uh, Machli Patnam, had uh, come into the Qutb Shahi territories in a proper sense. And that is the period when you see most of the uh, migration happening towards the Deccani uh, Qutb Shahi territories. Uh, a lot of influx comes in from Iran and other parts of India. And that is where the Golconda felt a need for a newer uh, capital. And there was no space left for expansion. But one place where they started doing the expansion was Ibrahim Bagh area, just outside of Makkah Masjid, um, Makkah Darwaza area. And that is one of the first areas where they uh, started expansioning the first. And uh, later they moved along the Musi River and finally crossed the Narva, which was built by Muhammad uh, Ibrahim Qutb Shah. And Muhammad Kuli makes a city there. So this is around... Uh, a, sh a Sufi Darga called, uh, uh, there was a Sufi guy who was uh, Shah Chirag living in the area Chichalam. That, that is where Hyderabad finally is. And that is the area where you present day you would find uh, the uh, necropolis of Dara uh, Mir Momin or co formerly known as Dara Mir Momin. And that is a highly, uh, one of the much densely 
you can say populated necropolis in that sense. Uh, next, please. So, uh, understanding the Persia Telugu sultans because this is this is one of the new areas I'm I'm exploring right now. But to understand uh, the Teluguite identity of the Kutub Shahis is very interesting because they had. Persian at the court, they had Telugu at the court, they had Dakhani at the court. So they, they had a very multilingual space to themselves. I found uh, the, uh, their Telugu farmans at the st working at the state archives. So uh, while going through one of the readings by Richard Eaton and George Mitchell, so I, I was struck upon this because the style of uh, planning the city of Hyderabad is very much similar to how Varangal was done. And even the Varang city of Varangal is, is, is a twin city of Hanamkonda. So this we are talking about like going back, back to their Telugu roots. Uh, so Hyderabad in that sense inherits both the Persian and the Telugu characters uh, when it form, uh, comes into being. Next please. So that is one of the places, Bachaya Shurkhana, because Bachaya Shurkhana is essentially a place where you would find people of many faiths. The Shias would come there as well, but many Hindus come there as well. So during the Muharram, if you go there, many uh, people living around that area, especially the, some of the earlier Marwadis, they go there and pay their respect to the alums during the Muharram. Next, please. So these are the alums which are erected during the Muharram there. That's the beautiful tile work it has. This is one of the structures which was built in 1592 uh, uh, and uh, later additions being done by Abdullah Qutub Shah in the 17th, uh, late part of the 17th century, you can say mid, mid of the 17th century. Most of the alums here are used, uh, are are from the Nizam period. Some of the original uh, alums survives, but uh, you can spot them in different Ashur Khanas. Like you can have a look at uh, one of the very nice alums at uh, the, um, Darul Shifa. Some of the alums survive at uh, Golconda's uh, Ashur Khane. So th there are a couple of uh, alums. Alum is basically a battle standard, which was held by uh, one of the foster brothers of uh, uh, of uh, uh, Hussein, and that's that's w actually became a symbol of Shia faith uh, as 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 a material culture. You can say one of the th things you would find prominent throughout their architecture and uh, and art as well is one is alam. Even you have alam uh, stucco work in the Qutb Shahi tombs as well. Next, please. These are the two structures, uh, very much iconic, very much monumental, built by two different sultans. One is uh, uh, Muhammad Kuli Qutb Shah. This one, Makkah Masjid, being built by Muhammad Qutb Shah, started in around 1617. So this guy uh, built uh, Makkah Masjid, and uh, finally it was completed by Aurangzeb. So it is very interesting story, and that that many years it took fi to finally complete it. Next, please. Uh, this is a very interesting painting I came across while documenting paintings at the Qutub uh, at the State Museum in Hyderabad. So on the left, you have a painting from uh, a French museum. Uh, this is uh, done around uh, the later part of the 17th century. Even this is 17th century around this later part as well. So the le left one is uh, in a European museum. And this has all the Qutb Shahi Sultans. So starting with the center, Sultan Kuli Qutb mulk then you have on the right, you have Jamshed, Ibrahim, Muhammad Kuli, then you have Muhammad Qutb, you have Abdullah, you have Abul Hassan. But in this one, <laughs> what we found at the State Museum, uh, here you don't have Abul Hassan, so probably built around you know Abdullah's period at some point. So Kuli in the center, Jamshed on the left with folded hands, then you have Muhammad Qutb, Abdullah, and then on one side you have Ibrahim and Muhammad Kuli. So it has a Deccani verses uh, around it, also has Arabic script on the top. 
this we are trying to decipher now and what it it actually says uh, next please so to brief about the Qutub Shahi Sultans a bit I will not read the entire thing I'll just brief about it so Sultan Kuli is basically credited for founding the Sultanate of the Qutub Shahis he is also credited for uh, one of the earliest buildings that is the Jame Masjid right outside the Golconda fort to build it and uh, after that he is credited for the building at uh, uh, inside the tomb complex he is even credited for uh, an Eidgah built inside the Qutb Shai complex and then you have Yar Jamshed Kuli or uh, Jamshed Kuli Qutb Shah uh, he is he didn't have a longer reign but his credit is that he actually formalized uh, uh, much of the administration you see in the Qutb Shahi territories and the, that structure he provided that stuck on to the Qutb Shahis for so long that it continued even until Abu Lassan. And then you have Ab Ibrahim Kuli Qutb Shah, one of the proper empire, empire builders of the Qutb Shahis. He is the one who actually patronized a lot of the Telugu poets at his court. He uh, introduced uh, Telugu uh, after after spending time at the Vijayanagara court, he uh, introduced much of the learnings from that Telugu court to the Qutb Shahi tel Telugu court. He uh, is credited for uh, many of the building works, but much uh, of that chunk remains around Golconda because uh, he is the one who actually walled the entire Golconda. So that major work was done during his period. Then you have Mohammed Kuli, the famous founder of Hyderabad. His, one of his uh, lesser known things is that he is one of the earliest or one of the earliest uh, Deccani poets who, poet sultans who actually wrote a diwan, complete diwan of Deccani Urdu poetry. And we have been fortunate to uh, find some of the uh, folios of that in the state museum and we have documented for the, uh, them for the museum. Uh, apart from that, he is also one of the sultans who actually patronized a lot of Shiite uh, building works like Bacha Shur Khana, Darul Shifa and that is the period when you see Shiism taking shape in terms of uh, uh, religious places as well. And then you have Muhammad Qutb Shah. He did not live much long but he is credited for, uh, uh, you can say, the Tariq works or one of the most uh, history writings or introducing literature to Golconda's fold. Next, please. As I said, Abdullah uh, came very young to the throne. He is often credited for uh, Golconda bringing uh, under the rule of the Mughals, but uh, he actually patronized numerous building works and he actually also expanded much of the Qutb Shahi territories as we saw in the map and he is the one who uh, in a way expanded the Indian Ocean uh, trade as well. He, he even sent embassies to the Aceh Sultans at, in, in 17th century. So apart from that, Abul Hassan is one of the lesser known figures because not many scholars have studied Abul Hassan in detail. There are many important Dutch sources to study Abul Hassan. Uh, apart from that, he is one of the sultans who is patronized for Kuchipudi. Uh, there's a very famous story when he was traveling around the port of Machli Patnam, he heard someone playing uh, Kuchipudi uh, uh, the music and when he saw the Kuchipudi dance form then uh, he was mesmerized with it and he gave a land grant to them and that land grant actually survives in some or the other way. So I was doing my field work in that area and I came across a family who actually had preserved it uh, passing on from the Nizams then finally they don't have the original document down, but what they have done is very interesting. They have done that entire Farman thing on the uh, in, a, in a steel engraving, and they have kept it for the visitors because people kept on coming and asking them, where is that famous grant which Abulasan gave it to you? Next, please. 
So now finally coming to the Machli Patnam and the Indian Ocean, how Machli Patnam had this sort of connections and uh, what sort of you know world it had access to. Uh, Golconda has had a very good access to the Red Sea as we know starting with the uh, Ibrahim and Muhammad Kuli Kutub Shah's period. But one thing which not many scholars have worked on is that uh, Kutub Shahis have had also very strong presence in the uh, Bay of Bengal region. And uh, they had very strong contacts with the Aceh, Johor, they had very con uh, strong co contacts with Perakade or uh, the Burmese ports of uh, like places like Martaban. So they had sent their uh, Persian merchants uh, or the state merchants to all these places. And those and thanks to these connections, the kind of things we have found at the State Museum, I guess I was blown about by that when I saw them for the first time. Next, please. Yeah, so these are the kind of things when uh, I was working in the State Museum and I found them and I was doc during the documentation. So one is the uh, is it's a Chinese porcelain, but done in Arabic. So it has Aitul Kursi on it. And uh, this is from the 17th century. But the interesting thing is that the guy who, who must have uh, done this uh, Arabic writing at that time, uh, sitting in Jingdijan or the Eastern China, would be, wouldn't have a very good hand at the calligraphy because he wrote it in a very Chinese style of writing the Arabic. And that is very much quite visible in it. And then you have the second picture is of, uh, you know, a typical uh, seal of Aceh, which was used. And these are the style of porcelain which the Aceh sultans uh, uh, ordered for the Islamic market. It has the name Akbar Shah in it. So probably this can date to the Mughals, but most of the copies as of now I have found are related to the Aceh sultans. So it is possible that this had might be sent by the Aceh sultans to the Mughals at some point. And then you have this amazing sword with the name of Shah Abbas on it. Uh, it was, uh, so I was going through the text uh, at one point related to the swords and the embassy exchange between the Safavids and the Qutub Shahis. I came upon this sword being gifted by Shah Abbas to the Muhammad Qutub Shah when he became the Sultan. And this was found in the State Museum's collection. I was quite blown away, blown away by this discovery. Next, please. And then finally, uh, this is a very interesting uh, uh, object we have been able to document. And this is my last thing to be presented. So this is the thing uh, we, when we started the work, and I used to have one-on-one -on -one sessions with Sujat Sab, and he kept on telling me, yaar, wo ek manuscript hai, usko dhundna hai there is one that manuscript and we have to look for it. Uh, he kept on narrating the same line again and again. Ye ke gufta khuda vanda, biha ke nuwe, pegambar, biraye kile gulkonda hai, kone jaat tufani. So it's, it's like, you know, your uh, Nimat Khali Khane Ali, who is a Mughal court historian, who is traveling around with the Mughal camp in the Deccan. He is present at the siege of Golconda in the 1687. So, uh, one thing which is very interesting is that he tries to mock the Mughals. Even coming from the Mughal camp, he mocks Mughals a lot. And another interesting thing is that uh, he's buried in Hyderabad. And uh, one of the most interesting things I've come to know recently. So I found six or seven versions of this manuscript across the uh, different archives in Hyderabad. This is one of the best ones we could have. This is from the state museum and uh, what the poet is trying here is that uh, when the Golconda's fort is finally won by the Aurangzeb after an eight month long siege. So he says that uh, Nimat Khali Khane Ali refers here to the last day of the siege. He heard people saying to God to help Golconda just like how God, God helped prophets like Noah, Moses, Jesus and Joseph during their tough times. They're hoping for similar miracles to save Golconda. And I thank you all for your patience and your time. And that's 
all from my side. Thank you. Thank you, Umang, for the interesting presentation on the twin cities of Hyderabad and Golconda and taking us through the rich archives that you have laid your hands on. Uh, just to note that Umang has recently been offered admission at the National University of Singapore for a PhD program, and he'll be moving there. All the best to him from his alma mater and the School of Historical Studies. While we come to an end to the lectures, and before we move to the final section, which is on the film screening, we have time for the question and answer session. So uh, for all of you who would like to have questions or comments to our panel, uh, please kindly go ahead. Okay, thank you. My name is Change from the School of Ecology. Um, I see the theme we are saying, restoring what is lost. Any uh, the presenters have gave us the historical perspectives. So my question is, I'm directing to say, the first one, say, on the left side. Yeah. So with the contemporary architectural design, uh, how are we restoring the past in the modern cities or in the modern society? Because people tend not to accept um, like traditional styles into modern structures. Hello. Uh, well, from what I could grasp of your question is uh, modernity and the trends that we have now. Why we are not following our traditional art forms, that I think that is what you are. Well, uh, that's difficult to answer, you know, influences are always there and uh, um, there's a whole theory be behind that, I will not go into that. but. Uh, normally, people adapt something if, if it is better. Now, uh, in, in, in modern times, some of the things, at least, I don't know about uh, the rest of uh, the stuff that we are aping. We are, for some reason, aping the West without understanding what is happening. Uh, it's a pleasant change to see such beautiful design here, but what is happening in our cities is in, you know, place like Hyderabad, or even I think other places, you, uh, our climate does not, uh, you know, form and function. So the problem is now we are going in for form without realizing the function, or with, uh, without giving a second thought to function. You have a glass building in a um, uh, country like ours, uh, and then you complain that it's not comfortable. That's a uh, self-defeating. That is why we look back at history and say, why are the walls so thick in Nalanda? Just was there six, six feet thick walls. And I think they were the most com comfortable people living here then because <laughs> they designed the buildings in such a way that uh, one, uh, apart from the load-bearing aspect, it was also a way of, you know, controlling your environment and making it livable without uh, unnecessary action. Now, what we are doing is we are just vaping the West. We say, uh, we have leaders in my own chief ministers in earlier times had uh, declared that they, they want to make Hyderabad into Dubai. I said, if you want to make it into Dubai, you go and live in Dubai. Why do you want to make Hyderabad into Dubai? So, that is the present attitude. I cannot ex give you an explanation as to why that is. But the point is, uh, when
when when when a culture becomes dominant and because of its successes material successes there there is bound to be a pressure on the uh, you know others to maybe ape it without really they say if we build buildings like that we if we live by that if we eat uh, um, like them we will be like them it's not possible but that's what you do uh, in hyderabad i have challenged everyone you know uh, someone spoke about biryani and halim uh, the fastest food fast food concept came in and they were serve, serving burgers and all that and to go 20 minutes for it to come i said you order uh, biryani in hyderabad it will be on your table in 5 minutes under 5 minutes all the time it takes to take it out of the deg and bring it to the table so these are concepts which are imported they are impacting life everywhere uh, i i fully have not fully understood why it, it is happening but i think uh, uh, i hope certainly it's a passing phase okay thank you Pass the mic to Dr. Tosha. Dr. Tosha. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Tosha Vantabhadan. I'm a faculty in the School of Historical Studies. Uh, sir, I just like to ask you about the Hawaiian term. Uh, what are the major challenges did you face uh, during the conservation and the restoration work at uh, the Hawaiian term? and also i just uh, like to like uh, also uh, suggest for our students what is the uh, career prospect in this uh, field conservation and the restoration thank you um i think um, uh, the humayun stone conservation was um, i mean there are young people here so the idea is that uh, to talk about rather than the challenges about the possibilities now when we really uh, took on the responsibility of undertaking conservation at the gardens and at the tomb it was something i think the biggest challenge was that there was no precedent something like that hadn't been done before in india a large scale single conservation project and definitely nothing by the private sector um and that challenge was also a huge opportunity um the opportunity was to create a model project that would then be replicated now in terms of model project the number one was of course the craft based approach to put the craftsman in the middle of the decision making process and uh, based that on that and the second uh, was the you know coupling the conservation project with both creating a green space as well as improving quality of life of local inhabitants and the third critical thing was um and i'm very interested that i'm speaking here at nalanda university the third critical thing was it was the first ever non profit public private partnership in the field of heritage conservation now i say nalanda university because there is absolutely no reason that a university such as this not play a pivotal role in the conservation of monuments in the vicinity including the world heritage site and that those are the three aspects that we wanted to stress upon one is private public private partnership second was craftsmanship and uh, the third is conservation as a means to a larger end and uh, and it's been it's been uh, quite uh, you know uh, we worked and it was a interdisciplinary team which is why also nalanda university can play a pivotal role because you have people from several different disciplines over here so those are the three or four critical things that we learned in terms of career opportunities again it's a chicken and egg story uh, unfortunately um, the archaeological survey of india is not utilizing the significant human resources available in india uh, from different aspects but all of that will change at some point and uh, it's already changing 
So I think uh, with, the, with the realization that our built heritage is an asset, an economic asset, um, that full conservation of which fulfills several government objectives, I think the future for young people with a lot of initiative is bright. Thank you, sir. Good evening, sir. My question to Mr. Nanda, sir. Uh, I'm actually not from the historical background, so I'm having from the School of Ecology and Environmental Studies and having a background of political science. So my question to you, uh, in of the one of the slides you portray that uh, Aga Khan Trust is working across the globe. So uh, where you are restoring all these ancient monuments, uh, what's your personal feeling that the ancient monument across the globe are in the same condition or the specific uh, condition that in the poor condition that you will find in within the India? And the second thing is uh, in specific in the one slide you portray uh, the area of the Nizamuddin area. So what's the reaction of the local people when you are uh, restoring all those uh, monuments in that in that particular area, how the locals uh, they contributed in that particular plan. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think, um, regardless of where we at the Aga Khan Trust for Culture work, it is very obvious to everybody that in some countries um, the the heritage value is better understood. Um, for example, in the whole country, in India, the whole country, we have less than 10,000 heritage buildings that are protected by law. These are buildings that are protected by the Archaeological Survey of India, the state departments of archaeology, and the municipalities. So, all over India, it's less than 10,000 buildings. While we pride ourselves as an ancient civilization, comparatively, in the United Kingdom, there are 650,000 protected historic buildings. In the United Kingdom, about 55-60% of construction industry budget goes into conservation. Similarly, in Italy, they realize that a large part of their wealth is created because of tourism and other related things related to historic buildings. Um, so, um, in and I think there is a greater realization of this worldwide, which is why buildings like the Bihar Museum are being built at excessive you know, cost, and which is why we are also called in by various governments worldwide to uh, help conserve these buildings and leverage these buildings for that social economic development of the country. But in India, I think there is, uh, as has been said several times, problem of plenty. Um, uh, we were at the Bihar Museum yesterday and the Director General was talking about the problem of plenty. And the same thing is everywhere you go. Um, uh, so resources are limited and say how much can we save. But what people don't realize, which is what we're trying to demonstrate, at Humayun's tomb, the investment that we made was realized in less than one year with increase in ticket sales. And since then, every year, the site gives a 10 crore surplus just in ticket sales. So there is that potential. So I think, which is one of the reasons of coming and talking to a young audience like this, is to realize that conservation is not only a, you know, a headache, a burden. It is actually a means to a larger end. Your second question about um, Nizamuddin, um, I think uh, if you had asked me this question six, seven, eight years ago, I might have struggled for an answer. But after the completion of Humayunstum conservation, the community came and handed over to us their principal mosque, which remained with us for five or six years, you know, the main. And we did a scientific conservation program over six, seven years on their principal mosque, which is, you know, there are four million annual pilgrims. Um, so I think the importance of doing that project was also for people to realize that these are historic buildings and they need to be kept in a certain way, not altered mindless, like a lot of religious buildings are across the country. So, uh, but also I think 
the project in Nizamuddin has been, I did not talk much about it, but or at all about it, has been a lot of women centric. So we built women toilets, we've got 200 women in a self-help group. Now we started a malnutrition program and for that we got women together to make healthy snacks. But they got us best incredible kebab, so we set up a kitchen. They're now traveling across India being master chefs at five star hotels. So there is a lot of, there are 30 kids from Nizamuddin who've gone to American universities. He's a first time English speaker. So there has been a huge impact because what we have done is for 15 years, we've concentrated on a very small population of 20,000 people. So usually development in the development sector, we say, oh, 10% increase in earnings. This has been women who've never earned a penny in their life, have collectively last year earned 80 lakh of rupees, which is almost you know, uh, for each woman in that group, 10,000 rupees a month, working at their own time. So these are these are impactful things. But uh, but uh, Nalanda University will have to call me back to lecture on that one. <laughs> Good evening, sir. So, sir, I will. Uh, I'm Stuti Kushwa. I'm from Historical Studies. So uh, my question is related to the growing world where we are living in a digital world. So in the discipline, we also have a course here, Digital Humanities, uh, where we learn about the digital conservation and preservation of the cultural heritage. So my question was like how it can play a significant role in the, these kind of lost heritages, where we see these, these heritages are losing, every day we are losing the connection with that heritage. So how it can bring back that connection by the digital form and also it can how it can also encourage the sustainability in the preservation and conservation program and also the further researches and how it can help the other research projects academic projects further um, thank you i um, come from a much earlier generation than you do but i think critically this is the new world i mean if you go to nalanda just for example if you go to nalanda and the bricks, you will see that the ASI has written on several bricks, 1930, 1960, 1970. And that was a process that was valid 100 years ago. Today, with the huge amount of you know, digital technology, at a push of a button, any expert should be able to tell which brick is from where. So a lot of conservation is changing because of that. For example, in the Humayun's tomb area, we found, we've worked on 60 monuments and almost everywhere architectural elements had been removed for the antique market. So jalis, we put one pattern of jalis back everywhere, but we did not put 2010 T, 2000 date on it because we realize that all our records are going to be on the website. Anybody can, anybody, any expert can tell and a normal visitor maybe doesn't need to tell. Uh, but also in terms of, for example, in 2014, the Humayun's tomb finial collapsed. But we had a 3D laser scan of it already done. And because of that technology, we were able to reconstruct that. I'm very uh, impressed to learn that uh, you have this course here at this university because that is really the need of the art. And, um, um, you know, there are various, uh, there is an agency called SciArc, in San Francisco who are documenting 500 sites uh, digitally for a record. There's another agency who approached us recently who have a, a bunker, um, underground bunker somewhere in uh, the Antarctica or somewhere where they are storing, um, you know, records from across the world in case there is, uh, you know, total disaster, this record will, so there is absolute sense, I mean these, uh, with the Department of Archaeology and Museum in Government of Telangana, we are recording or scanning many of these manuscripts that the State Museum has because paper is a fragile material. You can keep it under minus two degrees centigrade, but in our country resources are also limited. So manuscripts are lying at room temperature, which they shouldn't be. Uh, but, but all of that needs to go hand in hand. I'm afraid I can't even start telling you the amount of opportunity that this whole digital world has for conservation. In the end, I think I'll be learning from people like you um, 
or because but the opportunities are immense, uh, both in terms of preserving a record, but also uh, helping understand these buildings better. Good evening, sir. My name is Somnik Krishna. I am from fourth semester, School of Historical Studies. Uh, my question revolves around the uh, maritime nature of the empires of Deccan and how uh, the artifacts of China and uh, seals of Ake were found uh, in the region. So, sir, were, were uh, the artifacts from South Asia and the uh, eastern coast, were they also found or was it just a unitary exchange or was, did it involve both the empires in the regions? Uh, to, un uh, to answer that question, I guess Kashyap mentioned uh, during his introductory talk that uh, we found the Chinese porcelain at the Gutub Shahi tombs. So when you look at the uh, Chinese porcelain found there, some of them has in inscriptions, you can date them as well. And that is one place you find them. but. What interesting about Chinese porcelain about Deccan is that it's not a studded field altogether because what had happened that uh, most of the museums were under the Nizam's archaeology until uh, formally handed over to the state museums and the national uh, uh, ASI. So what is there is that you find a lot of Chinese porcelain there but you won't find much of the descriptions. So what I have been doing at the State Museum is that I'm trying to uh, put everything in a context. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, the Chinese porcelain piece, uh, I documented those, those showcased those two. I've done documentation for like more than 60 or 17 Chinese post porcelain pieces. So all these pieces are like, uh, in during the Nizam period, you don't have actual sense of uh, like where they are coming from, where they are. So there's no record record of that. They could be purchased, they could be you know uh, handed over as well to the museum. They could be found at a random historical site as well. So there's nothing like that. So what we have been trying to do is we are going with the inscriptions reading. We are trying to match it with the other museums as well. So that is one of major chunk what I have been doing there is that I'm trying to compare the objects what is available in different sort of museums across the world who have the online collections I think once you start reading uh, the Chinese porcelain more I mean studying the chi Chinese porcelain more in the Deccan context uh, you would find that uh, it, it this field has a huge potential and uh, I think uh, uh, one name which I can think of is Annie Grutzen at Leiden University. Who she has been writing a lot about the Chinese porcelain and a similar sort of work needs to be done catering the specifically the Bay and the Malay world. I, I would be looking into it into this in future but not at the moment. I hope uh, this answers the question. Maybe uh, if you have more specific questions about uh, the Chinese porcelain we have the curator of the gallery there here with us. She might be able to, you know, guide you more about it. If what what you are seeking? If you have, you can shoot her question. Uh, uh, good evening, sir. My name is Ratri Bhumik. I am a fourth semester student of historical studies. So uh, my question goes around uh, that: Where do you see public awareness in the? Uh, scenario of conservation and preservation of heritage and culture. I think um, um, I think it's all interlinked to what the public gets out of it. I think uh, what is happening now is that while His Highness the Aga Khan's been talking for almost 50 years about leveraging cultural assets for public benefit, the conservation world, UNESCO, ECOMOS, the conservation world has been talking about how to make the public help in conservation as guards or whatever. So there are two, our approach is being different from the rest of the conservation world. 
where the conservation world says, Chalo, there is public, they should protect this. We are saying, there is a site, let the site benefit the public. So the world is now, 50 years after we started this approach, starting to come around to our approach and realizing that until the community benefits from conservation in more ways than pride, its economic benefit, its um, mainly economic benefit, but improved quality of life through parks, open spaces. There are 40 parameters we look at. Until that happens, public awareness will be very limited and there will be a lot of disinterest. Um, so we are, I mean, the Sundar Nursery Gardens which we created now attract 1.15 million visitors last year. So obviously all those visitors will become sympathetic to the uh, heritage site. A lot of our work, uh, unlike other agencies, we spend a lot of time explaining to the public what we're doing and especially through social media but also on-site signage. So as conservationists, as historians, as anybody associated, it's our responsibility to inform the public in a, in a uh, friendly manner. Uh, what can be what has been what is being currently done to uh, secure the uh, secure the monuments from the uh, current environmental degradation and issues which have been going on what is the approach regarding that well fortunately the buildings we work are really stone and uh, buildings which are not really affected by some of the usual um, a lot of people ask this question and when you're talking about climatic issues, whether it's flooding or drought or pollution, I think the first thing would be to save humankind. I think the focus needs to be on, on humans before we talk about monuments. There are huge problems in areas like Jaisalmer where the buildings are meant for a desert-like climate and now are getting a lot of rain. But, uh, but we, are, we are not involved in those sites and, and we have done work in some climatically, uh, you know, sensitive areas, but that's a whole new chapter altogether. One point, I urge that you go to the Nalanda uh, site once again. The first thing I noticed that there was, uh, the lintels, you know, they have restored parts of it. The lintels and other members which are in RCC, they are now disintegrating. While thousands of years old brick structure is as it is. So that is a very obvious, uh, I think you should go and have a look again. I, that I was struck by that. Uh, why is this happening and why? Uh, Just to joke, that could be because of climate, it also could be poor quality of cement, so you can take your pick. I won't think. <laughs> well, I said an intervention, that's it. Uh, climate, of course, plays a major role. Quality of cement will also be there, but the point is time related. They've, those things have lasted, these things have not. Uh, so that is there. Uh, that I think should let you know that the old buildings were designed to last. That was the basic key. Any further questions? Okay, so we have had a long and fruitful session of presentations and lectures by our very distinguished panel. Uh, bringing into focus various aspects of conservation, importance of heritage, uh, very understudied sites in our vicinity, practices of intangible heritage, uh, which often gets overlooked in our studies and research, and finally on uh, the histories of urban settlements like Hyderabad and 
Golconda. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience having all the speakers with us at Nalanda. We have almost come to the end of the session and also the end of the day, so I will not uh, stretch things any further. Uh, for the formal vote of thanks, I would request my colleague, Dr. Elora Sribedi. Dr. Sribedi is a trained archaeologist. She works, she has ex extensively uh, worked uh, in archaeology. She is uh, in interested and in researches on visual traditions, Buddhist iconography, uh, is deeply uh, connected to research around South and Southeast Asian connections, practices of civilization, and has uh, traveled and lectured widely over to Dr. Tribbett for the vote of thanks. Thank you, Dr. Kashyap. So uh, uh, we had wonderful session and a very enlightening uh, talk and lectures. We got to understand few points. I think already Dr. Kashyap has summed up. But I would like to say that the ideas that we had about conservation, uh, restoring what is lost, is not only b about uh, conservation of the physical remains, the materiality, but also trying to bring back a cultural glory in tangible or intangible form. So um, uh, it was a wonderful experience from the School of Historical Studies to organize um, such a uh, beautiful session. Uh, for this, uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, we thank our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Sir, Professor Abhay Kumar Singh, for extending his support uh, from the Nalanda University and also for Aga Khan Trust to engage in this kind of conversation, particularly for choosing Nalanda University as a collaborator uh, so that our students across the schools can understand the proper nature of um, uh, heritage as well as architecture, culture, and conservation. So uh, from the School of Historical Studies uh, and Nalanda University, uh, we'd like to thank all of our speakers, and we would also like to felicitate some of them who are present here. So uh, to do that, I would request our Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir. Uh, please, uh, can you kindly come on the stage, sir? And I'll also request the office to bring in, so first and foremost, to uh, Ratish Nanda, sir, from Aga Khan Trust. I request Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, to extend our thanks from Nalanda University uh, by felicitating him. Thank you. A big round of applause, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I also request uh, Sajjad Sahid, sir, from Aga Khan Trust to come forward, please. We want to extend our thanks and felicitate you for your presence and for your interesting lecture. Thank you, sir. Big round of applause, please. Thank you. Uh, I would also like to ask if Archana Saad uh, Akhtar Ma'am is present here, or she is just absent for the moment. OK. So we'll, we'll send her felicitation uh, with her. Now I request if uh, uh, Mr. Umang can you please come forward from uh, Aga Khan Trust? Uh, it was very interesting and very detailed, and we are very honored to uh, felicitate and thank our former student, Umang Kochar, from Aga Khan Trust. Thank you so much. Uh, as a token of appreciation, thank you. 
I would also now request Ganga Devi Ma'am uh, from State Museum Telangana to please come on the stage. Would like to thank you from Nalanda University, our Honorable Vice Chancellor Sir. I would request you uh, to felicitate Ma'am. The small of. Thank you so much. I would request all the speakers who are uh, please uh, present for a group photo. Uh, uh, before that, I would just like to say a, f a few words of vote of thanks formally. Uh, Ganga uh, Gautami Bhattacharya ma'am has left. We thank her for coming, taking the trouble to come from Patna and to give her talk. We also uh, thank Archana Saad Akhtar ma'am who was with he uh, here with us. Um, we particularly from the School of Historical Study like to uh, acknowledge the immense effort of Dr. Kashav Ghani for organizing this symposium uh, and taking all the pain to go into the detail. A big round of applause for Dr. Kashav Ghani, please. And also, uh, we particularly thank our honorable uh, dean, sir, who is also here, all the students from different uh, schools, particular our faculties who are here. And we'd also like to mention uh, thanks to the online participants who joined through the YouTube link and making that possible. Uh, vote of thanks or thanks to particularly to our technical team, Mr. Sunny, Agam, Anuj, and others uh, for helping with the YouTube streaming and for making uh, uh, arrangements for the program. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I would request all the participants uh, with, uh, for a group photo with our Honorable Vice Chancellor sir, and Speaker. Please come for the group photo. I request Professor Mohanty sir also if you would like to join for the photo as well as all the colleagues who are present. Um, 